Welcome to another episode of Citizen Detective. I'm one of your hosts, Mike Morford. My friends call me Morph. I host several true crime podcasts, including Criminology, The Murder of My Family, Missing Persons, and Zodiac Speaking. And speaking of Zodiac Speaking, we have a case today that we're talking about, Sherry Jo Bates, a 1966 murder that may or may not be related to Zodiac but it is nonetheless a very fascinating case all by itself, whether it is or isn't. So we're going to need some thinking caps on tonight and going over the details, but we've got the team here ready to do that. And we hope you'll join us. If you have a voicemail that you'd like to leave for us, we may play it on the air. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, simply go to speakpipe.com slash citizen detective. Let us know what's on your mind, share your theory, ask your questions, all that kind of stuff. So with that, I'm going to turn you over to Alex. Thanks, Morph. I'm Alex Ralph, researcher and writer for Citizen Detective and Doc Miller's show Murder Was the Case. I'm a law grad with 15 years experience in criminal law, working prosecution and defense in homicide cases and other violent crimes. Want to remind everyone where to find us. We go live on YouTube, twitch.tv slash citizen detective twitter.com slash citizen pod and facebook.com slash citizen detective podcast. Lee. Hey, I'm Dr. Lee Meller, AKA doc murder. I'm the author of seven books, a couple textbooks on homicide host of murder was the case, the former vice president and head of behavioral for American investigative society of cold cases. I want to encourage you guys to go to patreon.com slash citizen detective and join the digital detective agency uh, not only do you get access to our scrum afterwards, which is like our citizen detective after hours, but uh, also there's some other perks and you help support the show. We want to be able to keep this going. I'll just say too, if, if you're a fan of murder is the case and you've been watching me, you've probably noticed I dropped off a bit this month. I've been pretty ill and I'm a little under the weather today. I think I got the COVID, the Rona that's, that's still lurking around, but uh, so I've been pretty low energy, everyone. And I apologize for that. I'm hoping to be able to pull it together at the end of the month and hopefully tonight too. Uh, as I've been laid up with uh, with the Rona, I've been watching a lot of movies and we got around to, to talking at the beginning of the show. Apparently there's some new good true crime stuff, Alex and Morph, that I've missed. Yeah, you know, you can always go on uh, Netflix, Hulu. Uh, I know we were talking before we started recording. I just watched a really good uh, Morgan Nick episode. Uh, series on hulu and it was a limited series i think it was five episodes something like that and her missing persons case is, is very interesting it's a well-known one so if you're if you're looking for something true crime related that's one that i would highly recommend it's a, it's a missing like little girl case yeah it's a little girl that went missing and they have you know, footage of a, a, a very unique red truck with a white camper shell that didn't fit properly in it. It's, it's one where you think, okay, everybody's going to come forward and give a tip of this vehicle and they'll catch this person easily. And they never did. You know, it's just one of those frustrating cases. And then they zero in on somebody that's a likely suspect. And, you know, I want to give too many spoilers away, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's still unsolved, unfortunately. Yeah, missing persons are tricky because you don't have that crime scene to go backwards from. So you, you don't even know what the motive is. You can make some assumptions based on who the victim is. But other than that, you know, you're, you're still even guessing there, too. So always frustrating. Yeah. Alex, you saw yeah. something pretty good, too, right? Um, not, not true crime, but you saw the new Boston Strangler? I did. Um, I was very impressed with it. It takes a slightly different tack. Um, than other serial killer type movies in that it focuses on two women who were the journalists who made the connections between the murders and they're trying to uh, get the story out and get police to focus on the fact that these were all linked. And I thought it was, um, it was a really tight film. It reminded me of uh, all the president's men, David Fincher's Zodiac, Mind Hunter, in that it was it was just very sub understated to the point. It was yeah, I highly recommend that. What would you call that? Like an uh, uh, you know an ink ink thriller or something like that? Like a journalistic thriller? I would call it a journalistic yeah. procedural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I I agree with Alex. It was a good show i watched it too and it was very zodiac-esque there was a, yes. you know, okay. a little bit of a fincher feel to it and um you know it was a good you know as you know a couple hours after it started it ended i was like that was a good good show yeah. i liked it 
Ridley Scott uh, is the director on it. And I've always felt Fincher is my favorite director. And I've always felt that Fincher is the new Ridley Scott of the later generations. And so you definitely get that, that feel, that similarity between the two of them. I did like there was an original Boston Strangler film. It was one of the first films that had split screens at the same time, which was used really well. I just didn't really dig the ending because they were still running with the multiple personality disorder thing at that time. And now that we know better, I'm just sitting there going, no, no, sex psycho, no. Yeah. But (laughs) And Tony Curtis, but you know, it's what they had at the time. So shall we get into Sherry Jo? Actually, let's uh, talk a little bit about the website if Morph would like to. Yeah, Yeah, uh, just a a reminder as always that we have a website now that you can go to. It's citizendetectivepodcast.com. You go there, you can find all the episodes of the show, leave comments on episodes, leave voicemails, uh, and it will have all the latest news about what we're doing, what the show is up to. So it's really your one-stop shop for everything Citizen Detective, so please go check that out. So, on Halloween morning, 1966, a groundskeeper found the body of Sherry Jo Bates in an alley near the campus of Riverside City College. She was stabbed multiple times, and the killer slit her throat. Riverside police have had a favorite suspect, a man who allegedly dated the victim in the months before her death. Others believe that Sherry Jo was the first victim of the Zodiac Killer. On tonight's episode, we discuss the murder of Sherry Jo Bates, suspects in the case, and links to the Zodiac murders. Our panel includes Cloyd Steiger, retired Seattle homicide detective and author of Homicide, The View from Inside the Yellow Tape. Susanna Ryan, DNA expert and laboratory director of Pure Gold Forensics, is back as well. Susanna worked on the Bates case and was featured in the documentary The Hunt for the Zodiac Killer. Also, Zodiac enthusiast and a wizard behind the curtain, our producer Drew Gray joins the discussion tonight, presenting his theories on the Bates Zodiac connections. But first, we're going to go back to Morth for some background on the murder of Sherry Jo Bates. Located in the Inland Empire, Riverside, California, lies 55 miles east of Los Angeles. Riverside's a major player in Southern California's citrus industry. It's home to the California Citrus State Historic Park. Riverside boasts four universities and college, including UC California Riverside and the location of tonight's case, Riverside City College. In the 60s, crime was a rare occurrence in Riverside. The college town was a peaceful, safe place to raise a family. Everything changed, however, on October 31st, 1966, when a young co-ed was found brutally murdered in an alley near the RCC campus. At 6.30 a.m., Riverside City College grounds, groundskeeper Cleophus Martin drove his street sweeper along Terracina Drive. As he approached an alleyway between the two unoccupied houses near the college library, he discovered the bloodied body of a woman lying face down in the dirt. Martin called police immediately and reported the hor- horrific discovery. Riverside police responded to a gruesome scene. The girl had multiple stab wounds and her throat was slashed. Police quickly identified the victim as 18-year-old Sherry Josephine Bates. Sherry Jo was a freshman at Riverside City College. She graduated Riverside's Ramona High School the year prior, where she was a popular cheerleader. A very pretty girl with blonde hair and blue eyes, Sherry Jo was ambitious, friendly, and outgoing. She was petite at 5'3 and 110 pounds. She enjoyed playing piano and worked part-time at Riverside National Bank. Sherry's goal was to leave Riverside and become a flight attendant. At the time of her death, she lived with her father, Joseph Bates. Her older brother, Michael, was in the U.S. Navy and did not live at home. The Bates family moved from Nebraska to Riverside in 1959. Sherry Joe's mother, Irene, suffered from mental illness and lived at a nearby care facility. Sherry Joe had a boyfriend, Dennis Highland, who she dated for about two years before she died. Like Sherry Joe. Dennis was a popular, outgoing high school athlete who also graduated Ramona High a year or two before Sherry Jo. Dennis also attended Riverside College for a time, eventually transferring to San Francisco State to play football. The murder investigation began at the scene. Disruption of the ground told police that Sherry fought violently with her attacker until the end. A search of the area revealed several clues. 
1969 Inside Detective Magazine article entitled Your Daughter May Be Next reported the police found spots of dried blood leading away from the alley, indicating the killer left in the direction of Terracina Drive. Police found no murder weapon at or around the scene, but did find a man's Timex wristwatch 10 feet from Sherry's body. The watch had a torn seven inch wristband and was splattered with white paint. Some reports claim that the watch broke during the struggle, the hands freezing at 1224. Richard Grinnell of ZodiacCiphers.com believes this is a myth. Grinnell points out that in the photo taken at the scene, the watch hands are at 907. He argues that the watch was still running at 907 when investigators found it and wound down by 1224 before police took the second photo. In the dirt close to the watch was a heel print from a man's shoe. Additionally, investigators found a cigarette butt in the alley close to a spot where a female student reported seeing a man smoking a cigarette. Police traced the purchase of the watch to a military base in England. The torn wristband indicated that Sherry may have ripped the watch from her killer's arm. The heel print was a size 8 to 10 military boot made by B.F. Goodrich with a waffle design on the sole. Sherry's car, a lime green Volkswagen Bug, was parked 100 yards away from the alley, 30 yards from the library. Through the window, police saw two books and a notebook on the front seat. Sherry's keys were still in the ignition. Police opened the hood to check the engine compartment where they discovered that the distributor cap coil wire was disconnected. Riverside PD lifted greasy palm and fingerprints from in and around the engine compartment of the VW. And we should note that the VW bug was more vulnerable to engine tampering than other vehicles because the engine was accessible from the outside of the car without releasing the hood from inside. However, police were unable to match the greasy to prints to anyone on record. Police had few answers to their questions, but they had a theory. Based on the tampering and prints, they, be, they believe that Sherry's killer disabled her car and waited for her to return and then attacked. Local newspapers wasted no time reporting Sherry's murder, publishing articles within 24 hours detailing the attack. The AP ran a story in the newspapers across multiple Western states. Surprisingly, police released many details of the case to the press. The articles mentioned the disconnection of the distributor cap wire and the discovery of the watch, a choice that came back to haunt investigators. Notable pathologist and autopsy surgeon Ephraim A. Modulin performed Sherry Joe's autopsy. A cursor examination of the body produced several hairs at the base of Sherry's right thumb. The hairs were carefully removed and placed in a clear plastic container for Riverside Police Department. Sherry's injuries were extensive. She had a fresh laceration to her upper lip and multiple shallow stab wounds to her breast, back, arms, and hands. The cause of death was hemorrhage from a gaping irregular laceration to her throat. The cut went through Sherry's thyroid cartilage in a left to right direction, transecting her car carotid artery and right jugular vein. Dr. Modlin noted abrasions to Sherry's face, hands, and forearms, supporting the theory that she had fought vigorously with her attacker. Additionally, he found tissue under Sherry Joe's fingernails. Modson found no signs of rape or sexual assault. He concluded that the weapon used was a short knife with a blade one and a half inch wide and three and a half inches long. Let me just repeat that, excuse me. The blade was one half inch wide and three and a half inches long. Modson estimated the time of death at nine to 12 hours prior to initial examination at the scene at 9.23 a.m. on October 31st. By that time, rigor mortis was present in Sherry Joe's extremities, and her skin was cool to the touch. Sherry Joe's stomach contents revealed that she had eaten a meal of meat and vegetables, quote, probably not more than two to four hours before death. On November 4th, more than 250 mourners gathered at St. Catherine's Catholic Church for Sherry Joe's funeral. Among the mourners were Riverside detectives. Knowing there was a distinct possibility that the killer would make an appearance, the detectives discreetly took photos of various men in the crowd. Investigators looked first at those closest to Sherry Joe. They started with family and friends, working their way out to more distant associations. They looked for anyone who had an issue with Sherry Joe or wished her harm. Detectives soon learned of the young woman's reputation as a well-liked and popular person. 
No one who knew her could think of anyone who would do what was done to Sherry Jo Bates. The brutality of the attack led investigators to believe that Sherry Jo was murdered in a crime of passion. They also toyed with the possibility that she knew and willingly entered the alley with her killer. On November 13th, two weeks after the murder, police organized a reconstruction of the night of the attack. They contacted and arranged for 65 people to take part in the effort. The participants were all at the Riverside College Library on the evening of October 30th. Investigators requested that they wear the same clothes, park in the same location, and sit in the same spot in the library as they did that night. Police wanted a full understanding of who was where and when, and what they may have seen. All but two individuals showed up, a young heavyset male with a beard and a young female. Neither came forward nor were identified. Those who participated provided hair samples and fingerprints. Each was eliminated as Sherry Joe's killer. The reconstruction allowed detectives to build a timeline of Sherry Joe's movements on the afternoon and evening of her death. Inside, detective traced her activities to that morning. On the morning of October 30th, Sherry Joe attended mass at St. Catherine's Catholic Church with her father. After the two, after the two had breakfast together, Joseph was heading to the beach and he asked his daughter to join him, but Sherry Jo had plans to work on a research paper and declined his invitation. At approximately 3.45 p.m., Sherry Jo called her friend Stephanie, asking Stephanie to come with her to the library, but Stephanie declined and Sherry Jo went by herself. Her father, Joseph, wasn't home at the time, so Sherry left him a note that read, Dad went to RCC library. Joseph Bates returned home at around 5 p.m. and found the note before going out again. According to Inside Detective, a witness drove by the Bates home at 4.30 p.m. And, sh and saw Sherry Joe's green bug parked in the driveway. Based on these two events, we know that between 4.30 and 5 p.m., Sherry Joe left and drove 10 to 15 minutes to the library located on the 4800 block of Magnolia Street. At around 5.30 p.m., Sherry, <clears throat> Sherry Joe phoned one of her co-workers asking about a term paper. The call ended a few minutes later. Sherry's timeline after that call is vague, so we'll pre present it as clearly and accurately as possible. Now, Richard Grinnell has done an excellent job documenting the sequence of events, and we encourage you to visit his site. The library opened on Sunday, October 30th at 6 p.m. and closed at 9. We don't know when exactly Sherry Joe entered the library, but we do know that while she was there, she checked out the books that police found in her car. Although plenty of people in the library that night knew Sherry Joe personally, Few saw her inside the building. At 6.10 or 6.15, a witness may have observed Sherry Jo driving through an air alley parallel to the library on Magnolia Avenue. According to Robert Graysmith, author of Zodiac, the shocking true story of the hunt for the nation's most elusive serial killer, the witness reported that a mid-1960s Oldsmobile followed the VW closely behind. The Oldsmobile may have been a bronze color. We must note that the sighting isn't confirmed by sources other than Graysmith. Inside Detective re reported that around the same time, four young men saw Sherry Jo pull in and park while standing at a fence close to the parking lot. They had a clear view of the green VW from where they stood. The men estimated that the time was about 6.13 p.m. The men stayed at the fence until at least 7.15 an hour later. The library books confirm that Sherry Joe entered the library at some point after parking. Earlier, we mentioned how people, few people saw her in the library. One witness, however, a young man who knew Sherry Joe, reported seeing her shortly after 6 p.m., writing with a blue pen in a blue spiral notebook. When the library closed at 9, the people inside departed to the parking lot where many saw the green VW parked in one of the spaces. According to Graysmith, and only Graysmith, some reported a light-colored Tucker torpedo parked behind the bug. The car did not belong to any of the students at the library. The torpedo, or the Tucker 48, was a rare automobile. Tucker only produced 51 torpedoes in 1948 before the company closed. It is possible that the witnesses were mistaken and that the car they saw was an older Studebaker, which shared many similar features with the Tucker 48. Police apparently came to the same conclusion about the car. 
In a news article asking for tips, investigators said they were looking for a late 40s to early 1950s light-colored Studebaker with oxidized paint. At 9.30 p.m., a female student walked by the alley where Sherry Jo was killed. She saw a man in the shadows between the two unoccupied houses smoking a cigarette. She was startled at first, but the two exchanged hellos and the woman went on her way. The alley was on RCC property, close to the library. The two vacant houses partially obscured her view and the lack of lighting in the area made it difficult for the student to see the man clearly. Inside Detective also reported that between 10.15 and 10.45 p.m., a nearby resident heard screams coming from the direction of the alley. The resident kept listening and after about two minutes heard what sounded like an old car start its engine. A second person in the vicinity also reported hearing a scream at approximately 10.30 p.m. We do not know the exact time Sherry Jo left the library. However, we do know it was no later than 9 o'clock p.m. This gives rise to a question. Where was Sherry Jo between the time her friends saw her writing in the notebook and her murder? Even if she left the library, the library at 9, the screams were not heard until after 10. When Sherry, when Sherry Jo failed to come home that evening, her father was worried, looking out the window, expecting her to return at any moment. At 5.30 the next morning, Joe Bates called the police to report his daughter missing. According to the autopsy report, Sherry Jo had a meal as early as 5.30 p.m. and could have been murdered as early as 9.30 p.m., just after the library closed. If the killer struck at 9.30, how do we explain the screams heard after 10 p.m.? A month after the murder, the Riverside Press Enterprise published an article about the case and the hunt for Sherry Jo's killer. On November 29, 1966, Riverside Homicide and the Press Enterprise received carbon copies of a typed letter from someone claiming to be the murderer. The letter is known in Zodiac circles as the confession letter. The letter included several details about the crime, which we'll discuss shortly. Interestingly, the author claimed that the murder was retribution for the number of times Sherry Jo gave him the brush off in years past. The mention of past rejections suggested that Sherry Jo may have known her attacker. Many questions remain, however, as to whether the letter was indeed written by the actual killer. Earlier, we discussed how police released many critical facts about the crime to the press. One disclosed detail was the disconnection of the coil wire from the distributor cap of the VW. The author of the letter wrote, I pulled the middle wire from the distributor. In older cars with distributor caps, the middle wire is the coil wire. Moreover, the author described dis disabling Sherry Jo's car and watching her inside the library. He stated that when she left, he waited approximately two minutes, then followed her out of the library. When Sherry Jo's car didn't start, the writer claimed to offer assistance, which she happily accepted. He also claimed that he offered Sherry Jo a ride home in his car, which was down the street. As they walked from the library, the author allegedly said to Sherry Jo, it's about time. Sherry Jo asked, about time for what? And he responded, it's about time for you to die. The letter also went into detail about the murder itself, mentioning the use of a small knife during the attack. The above details were available in local news reporting, making it possible to anyone, for anyone to use those facts to craft a false narrative as an attention-getting tactic or joke. The writer went to great lengths to hide his identity. The letter was typed, and the author used several pages of paper and a sheet of carbon copy to disguise the make and owner of the typewriter. The page mailed was one of the last in the stack. Eventually, police identified the typewriter as a royal with either elite or pika type. Police never have never matched any particular typewriter to the confession letter. Many members of the Zodiac community are convinced that the confession letter in the Bates case is the work of Zodiac. Others, however, are not as certain. We'll discuss comparisons soon, but first we have to make another potential, we have to discuss another potential communication by the killer. In December 1966, two months after the murder, a janitor at RCC found a poem etched into the under, underside of a wooden desk. The poem was so disturbing that he reported it to authorities as a potential clue in the Bates case. The poem, dubbed the desktop poem, was small, roughly five and a half inches in height and contained only 45 words. The title read, Sick of Living and, Unwill Sick of living, 
unwilling to die. There were no express references to Sherry Jo Bates or her murder. Underneath the poem were the initials R.H. The desk was in storage when the janitor discovered the poem with no clear indication of when it was written. Police were unsure if the poem had anything to do with the murder. However, they photographed the desk and logged it into evidence. After the letter and poem, Sherry Joe's case lost momentum. The college town was shocked by the murder, but eventually moved on. Riverside PD continued the investigation, but few leads turned up. At the six-month marker, the Riverside Press Enterprise ran another article reviving Sherry Joe's case in the public consciousness. On April 30th, 1967, six months to the day after Sherry Joe's murder, three letters were mailed to the Riverside Police Department, the Press Enterprise and Joseph Bates, Sherry's father. The letters were each postmarked in Riverside. Unlike the confession letter, these communications were printed in large, sloppy handwriting. The letters to the RPD and Press Enterprise included virtually identical messages. Bates had to die. There will be more. In the letter to Sherry's father, however, the word she replaced Bates. The new letters were different from the confession letter, which was neatly typed and mailed in an envelope with decorative handwriting. Conversely, the text of these letters was in all uppercase, rudimentary block print. The new letters had something in common with the confession letter, however. In each case, the author took great care to hide his identity. Remember, in the confession letter, the author used carbon copy and several sheets of paper to impede identification of the typewriter. Many believe that in the new letters, the writer intentionally disguised his handwriting with a childlike scrawl. The author signed all three letters with a single ornate res symbol resembling a Z. On the one-year anniversary of Sherja's murder, the Press Enterprise ran yet another article updating readers on the Bates investigation. On November 1st, 1967, the paper received a letter in response. This time the letter was postmarked in San Bernardino, California. San Bernardino is located approximately 12 miles from Riverside. Like the confession letter, the new communication was typed. It read, to the editor, your human interest story October 1st, 1967 about Sherry, the RCC girl that was killed, was very interesting. Perhaps a story about the boy that killed her could be more rewarding. If people were to read of the life of a boy that turned killer, they might stop to think about the lives of their own children. Are we laying the blueprint for another killer? Might be one of the questions brought to mind by such a story. It was signed with hope, Patricia Hotz, a fellow student. The Hotz letter has received considerable attention online over the years. One reason for the attention is that the, authorized, the author minimized Sherry Joe's murder, emphasizing sympathy for the killer. Some online Zodiac researchers theorize that the author knew the killer and sympathized with him. Others believe the letter was authored by the killer himself. In the last decade, however, Zodiac researcher Michael Butterfield tracked down a Patricia Hotz in San Bernardino area and asked her if she wrote the letter. Hotz admitted that she often wrote letters to newspapers. Though she didn't remember, she looked at the handwriting and admitted that she was probably the author. Hotz provided Butterfield with a handwriting sample that matched the writing on the letter's envelope, and it turned out that the letter was not at all connected to the other communications in the Bates case. No further letters or writings came after 1967. For decades, Riverside police have favored a single suspect in Sherry's murder. As the case is still open and the suspect is still alive, we will not identify him by his true name. We will refer to him by the pseudonym used by online researchers, Bob Barnett. Barnett became a suspect around 1968 when an informant reported hearing Bob admit to killing Sherry Jo. Riverside's theory is that Barnett was either romantically involved with Sherry Jo at the time of her murder or wanted to be. According to some sources, Sherry Jo was dating Barnett during the weeks before her death. Other sources believe Barnett pursued her, but Sherry Jo rejected his advances. Barnett was also a student at RCC in fall of 1966 and attended Ramona High with Sherry Jo. Some researchers claim Sherry Jo ended a relationship with Barnett after accepting Des Dennis Highland's proposal of marriage. The breakup occurred approximately one week before the murder. 
These sources state that days before the attack, Sherry Joe and Barnett argued publicly on RCC's campus, during which Barnett allegedly slapped her. Sources also state that Barnett knew Sherry Joe was at the library on evening of October 30th. That night, he was playing basketball with friends who reported that Sherry Joe called him on the phone. After the call, Barnett immediately left the game, stating, that bitch is going to the library. Around 1.30 a.m. on October 31st, witnesses saw two men with flashlights searching for something near the crime scene. Police wondered if the killer had an accomplice. Both Barnett and his best friend underwent polygraph examinations. The friend failed the exam. Barnett refused to answer so many questions that the examiner gave up saying, get him the fuck out of here. Again, we must note that these witness statements have not been confirmed. In later years, one of Barnett's friends came forward, claiming that early in the morning on October 31st, 1966, he listened as Barnett cried and told him that he had, quote, snuffed Sherry. Despite evidence incriminating Barnett, police were unable to link him directly to the crime. At some point, Bob Burnett moved out of the country. In 1998, he came back to visit family and police seized an opportunity. Armed with a warrant, Riverside PD intercepted Barnett at Ontario Airport and obtained DNA samples for comparison to those in the Bates case. By the 1990s, DNA was emerging as a powerful investigative tool in solving cold cases. Riverside availed themselves of the opportunity to use the new technology to confirm or eliminate Barnett as their prime suspect. Researcher Tom Voigt of ZodiacKiller.com interviewed Barnett in October of 2003. Barnett denied everything. He claimed he was in a steady relationship with another girl and never dated Sherry Jo, never argued with her in public, and never slapped her. He said he never cried to a friend on Halloween morning and never confessed to killing Sherry Jo. An FBI memorandum dated March 13, 2000, stated that comparison between Barnett's DNA and DNA from the hairs found on Jerry, Sherry Joe's thumb did not match. First confirmed Zodiac killing didn't come until 1968 with the murders of David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen in Vallejo, California. In 1970, San Francisco Chronicle reporter Paul Avery investigated connections between the Zodiac murders and the killing of Sherry Jo Bates. At that time, question documents examiner Sherwood Morrill examined the written communications in the Bates case with, with in the Bates case with interesting results. The confession letter provided few clues as to the identity of the author. The letter's envelope, however, was revealing. It was printed by hand with big bold dotted eyes. Morrill compared the letter and envelope to letters in the Zodiac case. While he was unable to glean much from the letter itself, he concluded that the hand-printed envelope was indeed a, the work of the Zodiac. There are several similarities in the language used by the writer of the confession letter and the subsequent letters sent by the Zodiac. In one phrase, the author wrote, she squirmed and shook as I choked her and her lips twitched. In a letter mailed to the San Francisco Chronicle on July 26, 1970, the Zodiac wrote, some I shall tie over anthills and watch him scream and twitch and squirm. In both letters, the word twitch was spelled incorrectly with the second T. The word squirm, which appeared to be misspelled in the little list letter with a W instead of U, was spelled correctly in the Bates letter. Morrill also examined the writing in the desktop poem, again concluding that the Zodiac was the author. When Paul Avery looked at the three letters with the text, Bates had to die, he couldn't ignore the similarities to the Zodiac writings. Sherwood Morrill examined the letters and again concluded the Riverside writings were unquestionably the work of the Zodiac. In recent years, the Riverside Police Homicide Cold Case Unit issued a statement revealing that in 2016, they received an anonymous letter from a man claiming to be the author of the three letters. The man stated that he was a troubled teenager in 1966 and wrote the letters as a sick joke. Riverside PD is currently of the opinion that the letters and poem were not written by the killer. This has not always been the case, however. Paul Avery discovered that in 1969, Riverside police contacted the Napa County Sheriff's Department following the stabbings of Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard at Lake Berryessa. 
the similarities between the two cases, particularly the communications by the killer, led Riverside to consider whether Zodiac was responsible for the co-ed's death. San Francisco Police Inspector Dave Toskey accompanied Ken Narlow of the Napa County Sheriff's Department and FBI agent Mel Nikolai to Riverside for a meeting with Riverside PD. Reportedly, the meeting lasted nine hours. Paul Avery later learned that investigators agreed then that the Zodiac was responsible for the Riverside writings. After a brief hiatus in Zodiac communications, the Los Angeles Times received a new letter in March of 1971. The letter was mailed from the town of Pleasanton in Alameda County on March 13, 1971. Besides being the first correspondent with the Times, the Zodiac diverted from his usual San Francisco postmark. In the letter, Zodiac gave police, quote, credit for stumbling upon his Riverside activity. One suspect favored by some Zodiac researchers emerged in the 2017 History Channel documentary, The Hunt for the Zodiac Killer. This suspect was Ross Sullivan. Sullivan worked at the Riverside City College Library at the time of the murder and purportedly knew Sherry Joe. We'll discuss Sullivan as a suspect during our discussion, but for now, suffice to say that co-workers described him as an odd duck, an unfriendly loner who was high on their list of suspects. Sherry Joe's case remains open and unsolved by Riverside police, who are convinced that the murder is unrelated to the Zodiac. Other investigators, as well as many in the online Zodiac forums, are firm in their belief that Sherry Joe was one of the first, if not the first, in the Zodiac series. And soon we'll dive deeper into the similarities and dissimilarities in the cases. Cloyd Steiger will join us with his perspectives in the Bates investigation. And Susanna Ryan is also back with us again tonight. In the beginning, we told you that Susanna participated in the hunt for the Zodiac Killer documentary. And Susanna will share what she can about her forensic work in the Bates case and her experience filming the documentary. Our producer and Zodiac aficionado, Drew Gray, is here as well to weigh in. So before we jump into the discussion, I'm going to turn this over for Lee and get his insights on the murder of Sherry Jo Bates. Okay, first things first. I'm going to try and keep this short, too, because I think this is going to be a good one for discussion. But uh, first things first, let's just do without these letters. We've already had two instances where letters have distracted. It was a troubled kid. It was someone uh, writing another time with some genuine interest and concern. So even if some of the communications are by the killer, even if it's the Zodiac, I think those are red herrings. And just from like a investigative and energy prioritization, let's get rid of those. What do we know? Okay, well, let's look at the timeline. Library closes at nine. We have people saying that there were screams at something like 1030 and, and we're trying to reconcile these things. But once again, if you account for them not setting their clocks back, it all makes sense. Suddenly, Sherry Joe leaves the library around nine, finds that the car is disabled. At this point, it seems like someone probably comes up to help her and they follow, go with this person into the alley, most likely. That's where the murder occurs. So... I think Occam's razor is we just blame it on the clocks not going back. Okay, so what can we deduct from these from the crime scene? Well, I think this perpetrator is actually quite organized, right? Like he has a pretty good plan. I'm going to disable her car, and then I'm going to present myself as as help for it. Or maybe he doesn't even do that, but she's going to have to walk away, and and then I'm going to intercept her. So there is some planning, there is some foresight there. But then when he actually starts to commit the murder. He loses control. You can see that by um, the the fight that she put up, uh, by the fact that it takes so many blows to, to kill her. This is not picaristic sexual behavior. This is someone who's lost control of the victim. And I imagine the throat being slashed actually is because she's screaming that sound that was heard. And he realizes, I've got to cut her throat to make, uh, to make her stop making this noise. In this guy's head, when he was scripting it out, it was like, oh, I'm going to stab her a couple times, and then she's going to fall down dead, just like in the movies, except that's not what happened. So what does that tell us about this offender? Well, I think you could say it's his first murder, because that's that's something you definitely learn on the first murder, is it's not like the movies. Uh, you don't just stab her once or twice and she dies. And you're going to want more and more control over the victims in, in future murders. So the planning is there, but he, he doesn't, the, the phenomenological experience of the murder, um, that is, is not present. So I think we're looking at an offender who, uh, he's not dumb. He might even be slightly above average intelligence, 
uh, but he's inexperienced. He also leaves the watch behind that shows inexperience too. So I, I, I'm tempted in a way you've got this paint spattered watch that's left behind. I'm, I'm tempted to say he, he's, he's not very conscientious. He's sloppy. He's messy, but I, I don't want to, I don't want to run with that because I think we can chalk a lot of that down to the inexperience. We've got a shoe size too. And I, I think the shoe size is really important because that is going to put the offender around about five foot eight. Roughly you can give or take maybe two inches in both directions there maybe, you know, more like one, one and a half. But when we've got like a suspect like Ross Sullivan, he looks good for a lot of reasons, but you really think he's going to have shoes that small? Ross Sullivan is six foot two and he's going to have, what was it, size eight shoes. So for that reason, he's just really uh, improbable. And another thing I think is really important here, and this will be my last point and I'll end with this, is that uh, it seems to me that this person knew Sherry Joe Bates uh, because he would have to know uh, which car is, is hers. He's not just going around targeting random cars. He's targeting the attractive girls car specifically. And then, like I say, he's probably presenting himself as the solution to her problem. And so how does he know that? Has he been watching her at the library for some time? Well, that, that's a possibility, but how well does he know her habits? And when he presents himself to her as the solution, um, why is she going to take that? Why doesn't she just go uh, to a, a nearby dwelling or a phone booth or something and, and call for help? Um, there's probably still uh, people working in the library she can go to. I think it's because uh, they know each other somewhat, even if just by name, maybe they're in the same class. And and the multiple uh, stab wounds, it's not just panic, like the desire to actually do this. Well, what is it? It's It's anger against her. It's anger against her for something that she has done, something that... Uh, she is perceived to have done or something that she represents. So uh, it could be a misogynistic crime. Like in the letter, she was the attractive girl who snubbed me, but it could be something more personal too, like Sherry Jo Bates, not just the, the larger scale attractive girl, but Sherry Jo Bates specifically snubbed me, but maybe I didn't even ask her out. You, you see, it's, it's, there's, there's a bit of an incel vibe potentially going on here. Or maybe something even more personal we don't know. But I'm going to, this is an anger-driven um, crime uh, by an inexperienced young man, probably white, probably around 5'8", give or take a few inches. Blue collar, by the way, we've got the paint-spattered watch. We've got a guy who knows how to monkey around with the cars. Um, and so that's what I'm going with uh, for now. And we'll just pull everyone back up and we'll have a good discussion about this. You brought up some good points, and, and one of the points was, I, I think I agree with you that there's a very good chance that Cherry knew this person because, you know, when her car didn't start, she could have easily went back into the library. There were still people leaving. There were still library staff there that were probably closing down, but she chose to walk to a dark alley with this person. You know, you're not going to walk there if this guy looked like Otis Tool. Right. some creep some old <laughs> creep you're not going to walk into a dark alley with him so i think on some level sherry felt comfortable with this person either because she did know him knew him casually whatever the reason she felt safe enough to walk with him into a dark alley versus you know someone like uh, you know the typical monster oddest tool right. he looks like a serial killer you're not going to go anywhere with him in the in the dark alley so i think that's a big clue and then but also maybe this person didn't know her that well because he had to sabotage her car to stall for time to get her to interact with him as opposed to someone that just knew her oh, well a, that that could have brought up a, a conversation easily and didn't need to disable her car to to talk yeah. to her. that's a very good point morph he's yeah. not relying primarily on social skills so i think that tells us something about him too if it was um well i was going to use bundy that's not a great example because he had props but there's there's a lot of offenders who, because they know they have this gift of a gab, they're just comf comfortable walking up and starting a conversation. Um, but you're right, he has to present an error for him to come in and fix. And so what does that say about himself and his skills? Probably that that's primarily how he sees himself as, as being useful to women, right? Like I'm, I can be here to fix a problem for you. So I'll create the problem in order to be the solution for it. He, he can't just do it by his own charm. So I'm really glad you brought that up. And I want to add that to, to the little mini profile I gave there. This is not somebody who's primarily charismatic, primarily verbal. Um, they're more primarily handy and probably quite introverted. 
I wonder if it's possible someone that she may presume she could trust would be a maintenance man on the college campus. Mm. The Maybe only thing even I, the only thing about that where I'd I'd push back a little bit is um it seems like a younger man's crime, uh the mm -hmm. the way it was executed. Uh, but then again, if it's a first murder too, and 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 this is a guy with not a high IQ, yes, it's possible. But I was thinking just by likely a same age group peer and mm -hmm. an inexperience, but it could be a maintenance man. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do know that they looked at a lot of different suspects. You know, I, I know some names on that suspect list that Riverside checked out, and they they range from Bob Barnett, who we discussed at length to um military guys that were stationed at the base um you know there were the three guys standing near the fence that saw her pull in were construction workers because there was construction going on we didn't really mm -hmm. mention that mm -hmm. at the at the right. library at the time so that could have invited any number of different people that wouldn't normally be there to to be working in that area so it could have been a construction guy there's uh, endless possibilities unfortunately well this paint spattered watch is a pretty large clue i mean you have white paint on a watch i'm assuming it's not just one or two little specks for them to say it's you know paint spattered so then you're looking okay who locally is is doing painting with white paint and who's yeah. missing or, the watch and who has scratches yeah, but, on them probably right yeah but, right, but and I, no I, I can go back to times when I painted my house and I had paint all over my clothes, all over my watch and stuff too. So I, I, I get how that's definitely a clue, but at the same time, it could be, you know, a, a, a rabbit hole. I looking at the picture of the watch, which we weren't able to show tonight. I was not able to see like a heavy splattering of paint, nothing so, obvious. So it's so one it of those things where they really take a minuscule. small detail and they, blow it up for headlines or whatever and to make it sound good and it's perhaps in well it could be spattered but just not there we go that you can there we go yeah yeah and they don't really zoom in on it well and this is a you know a picture taken in 1966 so um you know and but there were there were important clues though you know you've got that heel print there um that, was it that size eight mil size eight eight to ten eight to ten yeah Okay. And it was a military boot, right? And this is a watch mm -hmm. that was sold at a PX in right. uh, in the in England, I believe. Um, so that could indicate a military yeah. background, overseas um, so connection. Yeah, some right. kind of clues. Now, does that mean it's a person in the military, or he just has access to the local PX? Because this is a big military town. There were different bases right there in that area, so he could have been a dependent, a son of a mm -hmm. military guy, or a military guy himself, possibly. Morph, could you talk a little bit about the daylight savings time issue? Yeah. So, you know, that was, I, I don't know if I'm the original person that brought that theory up, but I, I had always wondered if, if, if she was killed, because I can't picture Sherry spending an hour with this person, you know, in that alley talking for an hour mm -hmm. until a scream would be heard at 10 o'clock. Um, unless she really did know him well and was there having a full conversation that turned sour at some point. But you know, I always wondered, you know, it's fall back uh, on the clocks at time. Um, so, you know, if you set your clock back before you go to bed mm -hmm. and, you know, typically you do it right before you go to bed on, on what is it, Saturday nights usually, um, you turn it back an hour before you go to bed. Um, so, if they, you know, at that time that they see is 10 o'clock, um, I don't know what the police did as far as comparing the clock and saying, okay, was this 10 o'clock after you changed your time? We, I don't know that detail, you know, how closely the police looked at whether this person had turned their clock back when they said they heard a scream. Did they look up at their clock and see 10 and they're adjusting it to you know vice versa i don't know that so it could you know it's just a way to explain away an hour uh, off because it, it just would be hard to believe that sherry would go spend an hour with this person in there in a dark alley only to be killed an hour later so i always wondered yeah. if it was somehow possible yeah. that the time change had affected when they heard the scream and it was really 9 15 somehow when they heard it and for there to be no witnesses of that as well, right? 
mm-hmm. for those two to be talking in a dark alley at night where presumably the voices are going to travel. There's going to be other people on campus and then nobody notes it. And, mm-hmm. and also why would she do that for, for an hour? I mean, with someone, you know, by the way, her car is broken. You know what I mean? You're not going to be thinking, oh, I'll get around to that. Yeah. That's an immediate right. problem. That even even if you've got a ride home, that's still an urgent thing. I've got to fix that. You're not going to going to want to linger. And how frustrating is it? How many cases have we heard where so and so heard a gunshot, so and so heard a, a girl screaming, but didn't call the police? Just very frustrating that you know you hear somebody screaming on a s- Sunday night, you know nine ten o'clock at night. It's dark out, and you don't call the police. You know it's just frustrating when you hear that in these some of these cases. Yeah, although to play devil's advocate, um, when I was living in the city, uh, in a few cities, I would hear women screaming on the street so much. At some point, you get kind of sick of running out, and you realize there's just a lot of drunk people screwing around. Yeah, but that, this town, I don't think was that town. You know, this was a quiet no, probably not. area uh, on a college campus at 10 o'clock at night, 9 o'clock at night. It's dark out. It's Sunday night. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't know what you know what would have prevented them from calling but maybe you know who knows i I can't speak to it it's always just frustrating to me when i hear something like that yeah i remember the kitty genovese case in new york city uh and the the mythos surrounding that case for decades was that um she screamed and nobody came to her aid no one called the police no one did there was a complete sense of apathy around Mm -hmm. it and that is even since been uh determined to not be true People did call. They did try to do something. So in a town like, like Lee said, in a town like Riverside, the chances of um, hearing something like that and not trying to do something about it is kind of mind boggling. Mm-hmm. Lisa Gray says on Alex's point, I feel like a friendly acting maintenance guy Two who could also, also be younger. Be Surely there were younger maintenance men then, someone who would blend in easy and be able to go unnoticed. It's a good point. Yeah. Yep. And, and I we, we didn't touch on this, but I can tell you that they looked at every custodial person, every employee in that college was looked at closely, every teacher. Um, they looked very closely at everyone connected to employment in that school. Including fingerprinting? I, I don't know to what extent they went, but I know they did look closely. Now, as someone that has gone on record to say Riverside has not handled this case well, would be an understatement. It wouldn't surprise me if they somehow managed to let someone slip through the cracks that they should have looked at closer. Um, but, you know, they, to their credit, they did look and, and get a list of everyone connected to that school, students, you know, we mentioned Ross Sullivan, the, the library staff has turned him in immediately almost as, as a mm-hmm. suspect and they did check him out. Um, so, you know, again, I, I'm, I'm very critical of this department, but in, in certain instances, it does seem like they did the right thing as far as investigation. Uh, someone from citizen detective from the digital detective agency Says, sounds to me like she was led from led from the car with a weapon. What do you guys think about that? I think if you're going to pull a weapon on her to gain control, you don't go to the trouble of disabling the car. Good yeah, point. and then and then, do you really spend an hour with them in public place where someone could walk by, or it just seems like a big risk to to do that? Wait, let's try and map out the time. So, say she leaves the library at the latest possible time at nine. The car is like right outside, right? It's not going to take her even more than 10 minutes to go to that car and find it doesn't start. And then, um, and and so even if it's 9.30 where the murder happens, there still has to be more time chewed up than just going to the car. Damn, it's not starting. Go somewhere else, right? So if someone accosts her there and with a weapon immediately takes her in the alley and kills her, that, that almost seems like still not enough time for if, if we're going with this thing where the clock is off by an hour. Morph, right? So it's 9.30, roughly? Yeah. I mean, depending on how much time, you know, they actually t- conversed and, and talked. And maybe at some point she says, hey, I'm getting a bad feeling here. And she tries to leave. Who knows what happened? But 
Um, I, I just go back to the fact that whoever it was, I can't see her going into this dark alley with some creepy, monstrous looking guy. I think he no. sort of blends in with her her people that she's used to and, and she's not concerned about him because I don't think she would have gone there with a some creepy string. I, I think, though, if she had a bad vibe, too, she wouldn't walk into the shadowy alley when you've got all these buildings, presumably with lights on in campus to go to. Exactly. Um, plus, she's got to walk all the way home, right? Um, this is a good point. Why did she leave her keys in the car? She did. That's accurate. As far as we know, that's what sources tell me. Okay, because she, yeah. she's expecting the problem to, to be fixed. She's in the car trying to start it. Maybe this guy's come along. And try to exactly. start it because he can't just come along and be like, "Oh, I think your distributor coil's off, right? How would I know that?" Um, so he, he's coming along and uh, and trying it to feigning surprise, and then um, yeah, I don't I, I don't know, but that is a good point because she would if she was going away long term. So if she was going to walk back home with him, she would take the keys. I think no point in leaving them there. So she probably didn't think that they were going somewhere long term. Maybe they were going somewhere briefly. Or, or walking over to, to, yeah. to speak about something. He, he could have said, let's go over to my car. I got a toolbox in my trunk or something. You, you never know yeah. what what she could have been told. Or I got something in this alley here or my, I don't know what the layout is, my apartment's off this or whatever it is, but something that necessitates leading her into there briefly. Like you said, more, I, we just need to get this. Yeah. And that could actually, uh, feigning attempts will you know, you sit in your car, you keep trying it while I mess around over here and see if this works. That could account for a fairly significant length of time. Yeah. Because if you're just going to stab her anyway, like why even bother leading her away? Just stab her in the car. The issue I see to is the that... the library where other students were. Yeah. The issue I see is that the longer this person lets her sit there, the more chance there's a witness that sees their mm -hmm. interaction. So... If, if, if I'm trying to put myself in his place, I'm trying to get her into that alley as fast as possible, not leaving her to sit there near the car, trying to start it for when I know it's not going to start anyway, I would try and whisk her out of there as fast as possible. Hmm. And if I would love to know, um, because my partner taught at a community college for decades, if there was an automotive program, a building close to where she was at and the library. Um, well, if we just go in here, I can get the tools. And then as they're walking, he knows that alleyway. Mm. And then he knocks her into there. Yeah. He, he does want to get her into the it. alley. You're, you're, yeah. He definitely wants to get her in the alley because it's dark. And, and that's why he doesn't just kill her at the car. Right. Right. Um, and so it has to be a ruse together there. It's not a ruse about something temporary. They wouldn't leave the keys. And and right. so and so if he's just going to put the knife to her there and say, come with me, why doesn't she resist there since she resists anyway? But I, I think we have to go back to to the point that this person might be targeting Sherry specifically, not just a random I think he is victim. because the, the yeah. one student, the, the woman had walked by and noticed the guy in the dark alley smoking a cigarette and she couldn't really see him well but she said hi and he said hi back he didn't try and attack her so if if he's the killer and he's the one that that attacked sherry then he was perhaps waiting for sherry specifically yeah well to go for that car too how do you know it's not a man's car right how do you know it i mean is it just a coincidence that it belongs to this attractive popular girl right i don't think it's so. a it was a very distinct car and anyone on that campus may have seen it in the past. Um, but then again, you know, maybe it was a guy that saw her driving on the way to the library and saw she was attractive, noticed her car, made a U-turn and followed her into the parking lot. We can't, I don't think we can rule that out either. Yeah. Should we get, let's get Cloyd up. Yeah. Let's bring Cloyd in. Hey. Hey, Cloyd. Hey guys. What are your thoughts? So what do you think, Cloyd? What's that? Alex, what'd you say? I said, so what do you think, Cloyd? Well, uh, I, well first of all, I, I do believe that this whole time thing is BS. I don't think she was out there an hour, more than an hour, this guy. It was either a mistake because they didn't set the clocks back or something else like that. Uh, I agree with pretty much everything you guys have been saying. Um, 
I think it was probably somebody she recognized, at least casually, that she would go in the alley with. Uh, I think, uh, you know, it's just a bad deal. And she probably got, like you said, she she got a uh, the hinkies, and he, he started screaming. People heard their screams, but nobody called, and she was killed. But I think it happened closer to 930 than 1030. I don't believe that for a second. Right. I'm, I'm curious, Cloyd. How many cases have you worked where there was a disabling of somebody's car or some kind of ruse to to get gain their trust and and act like the knight in shining armor? Have you worked cases like that before? Yeah, you know, I'm trying to think of it. I I can't think of any off the top of my head because um, that's that's pretty. It's really unusual, actually, it, to to be that. It's that's more you know, you're talking targeted a serial killer or a no. targeted person not a casual murder that happens because of an argument. So there was a, yeah. a serial killer in South Dakota called Robert Leroy Anderson, and he worked with an accomplice and they made um, like metal caltrops, like tire spikes that you would, then they throw them out on the highway oh, right. uh, waiting for a specific victim, by the way, this Russian woman that worked with them. And the one guy be there with a walkie talkie and be like, she's coming down the road. Anderson would throw them out. They burst their, her tires would pop and then I drive along and they'd be like, Oh, Hey, it's you. Good thing. We're here. Like, do you want to lift? Yeah. And then they put her on the torture rack. So, right. I mean, yeah. Chloe's right. It, it, it's, it's, I only know it in um, serial killer. Um, yeah. It's, not, it's not something I see every day or something. Or, yeah. Alan, that. Alan Craig McDonald, a Canadian serial killer killed a woman. Allison. Something. Sorry. I don't want to get the wrong name. He <laughs> screwed with her car at like a Burger King parking lot a bit later at, um, you know, had mechanical failings came along and, and killed her too. So it's just a serial killer thing generally. Right. I can tell you this in the sixties, um, during around the time of Sherry Joe Bates, uh, case. Um, and I want to say this was closer to, uh, to Los Angeles, I think closer towards the bigger city. There was a rash of good Samaritans that would say, Hey, your tires loose. It's wobbling. Let me, uh, tighten up your lugs for you, and the the woman would pull over and and let him you know, the good Samaritan go over there and tighten up her lugs, and she'd drive a few feet, and the tire would start wobbling and fall off, and that was actually a pattern of things that was going on to to where there was actually a couple newspaper articles warning uh, mm -hmm. women not to if they're driving at night not to allow people to mess with their tires, right. even if they say they're helping them because they were really loosening the bolts and they would drive a few feet that would fall off. And then they would come back and say, oh, well, let me help you. And this yeah. actually happened. This is one possible, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but there's a, yeah. a possible Zodiac victim that this happened to. Um, but so it was something that, you know, was going on there in, in California during the 60s. Right. Yeah. What do you think of um, Offender's Age, Cloyd? Well, I agree with you. It's I think he's going to be a younger guy, not... He's certainly not an old man, but I don't think he'd be much over 30 just because of the way this is going. And it's probably somebody, like I said, one of her peers or somebody she knows at least casually, like you said, that would could tell her to walk into this alley and she'd do it, right? She's not going to go there with a complete stranger, especially a creepy guy mm -hmm. going to that. So it seems most likely it's somebody she recognized at least casually, and was able to, he was able to put her at ease to get her to go in that alley. <laughs> yeah, probably just something like, yeah, I'm, I'm just parked over here. Right, Let's yeah. Go get my stuff. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, she, she needs help. It's it's nine after nine o'clock on a Sunday night, and she's like, oh my gosh, it's October, so it's probably, it's dark, you know, and she's like, I need to get, and she feels like, well, I need help. I, I can't get out of here. So that, that's what she does. What do you think well, about I, the motive? Well, I think uh, he probably either he probably was obsessed with her some way, or else they had a previous relationship, and uh, you know, and he just, you know, I, you know, it seems psychosexual to me. I don't it, even if she wasn't raped, it doesn't mean it wasn't psychosexual. That's mm -hmm. motivation. You know what? I'd I'd like to get your opinion, Cloyd because this detail has always bothered me that the police would release so much information about how the car was disabled to, to allow this 
confession letter writer to send this information. Now you never really know if they're the person. Yeah, um, that's a huge mistake. Huge mistake. And I see that done all the time. Now, Riverside today is a different place. They have a lot more crime. They're a lot more savvy. In 66, they must not have been. So, but, you know, that was, and I see these people do this. It's like, give me a break. I, you know, I, I, I looked at a case one time and the same thing happened. This guy, right, tells all the stuff he knows about this crime. And they can, they charge him with a crime and ends up, all this stuff was in the paper. And everything he said was in the paper. Don't release that stuff. Hold stuff back. Hold the, the fact that the car was disabled should have been held back. Uh, that her throat was cut should have been held back. Uh, all this stuff. So that when somebody confesses to you, you know, I, I, Lee and I, my, uh, I was talking about this today in a class with a friend of ours, Colton Daniels. Uh, Dwayne Harris, who was a serial killer, he cut this woman's throat. And he said, and when he told me he cut her throat, I said, Dwayne, did you cut her throat once? He said, no, I cut it three times. And I knew that was true because I'd been at the autopsy and thought three slashes. I did, that information wasn't released. That's the type of stuff you need to know to corroborate confessions because there are whack jobs that will confess to crimes that they didn't do or write letters in uh, pretending to be the guy and send you down a rabbit hole. That just, it's one of my pet peeves when police departments release way too much information. It should be done by agencies that don't get this many murders. And I don't know how many murders they had in Riverside in 1966. Negligible. Yeah. Crime yeah. is negligible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we were yeah. talking about the Boston Strangler earlier, right? And when they put in the newspapers that he ties a bow, mm -hmm. uh, well, then right. everyone that, that wanted to commit a homicide of a, of a, a woman in Boston yeah. ties a bow. It wasn't me. It was the Boston Strangler. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right. You, yeah. you don't do that. You don't do that shit. You know, just it, uh, my pet peeve. It's, <laughs> it's ironic, too, because eventually when the Riverside PD reached out to Napa County in the Zodiac case to say, hey, your case might be connected to ours, this person wrote a confession letter in our case and he included details that only the killer could know. And I'm like, yeah, no, not true. yeah right. it was, it was on, in every newspaper <laughs> on, the, on the West coast, every detail that, that yeah. was in that confession letter was in there. And that's so, why you know, I, I was handling a high profile murder one time and a, and a local news reporter that knew called me on the phone and said, give me more information. We can help you get this guy. I said, no, because everything <laughs> I tell you, I'm whispering into the ear of the real killer. Right. And right. he'll know where I'm at. I don't want him to know where I'm. He, if he if he knows I'm close, he'll get he, he might destroy evidence. If he if it were way off, he may relax and not make a mistake. I want him to wonder and make a mistake. And in this case, that guy did make a mistake. And that's what we got. It. So I have a question, uh, Morph. The Bates had to die letters, and the person who later came forward saying he was a troubled teenager, he wrote the you know it was a sick joke. What do we know about? Has that been confirmed as true or? What do we know Riverside, about that person? Riverside reported that this person admitted to it, uh, as, you know, in recent years. And I, I think from what I, how I understand it, they sent a letter into Riverside. Riverside took that DNA and maybe did genealogy and tracked it back to this guy and confronted him. And sure enough, this guy was a young teenager, probably not old enough to commit this crime in 1966 but his story seemed to check out that he did write the hand scrawled notes not the confession letter um, right. that's still up in the air as to who wrote that um, but I, I think they're satisfied that this guy wrote the handwritten notes um, as, a, as a prank um, which is troubling because now you have Sherwood Morrill who had confirmed these he's the, the head document examiner he confirmed these later on as being zodiac's handwriting um and now if this is true that this y young kid wrote them that we know he's not the zodiac so um that sort no, of throws all know. it or throws all the handwriting in the case in the question because you know Correct. we yeah. already know that fingerprints and dna is is real physical evidence handwriting is somebody's opinion yes. um right. edu yeah. educated opinion but still just an opinion but it's like i was saying to you with um investigating zodiac morph there's not a scarcity of evidence like there's a lot of different avenues to go to so you want to cling to the most reliable stuff and so if you're looking at at zodiac you don't want to get lost in riverside because it might not be linked to him at all exactly and, 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 you're, and so you you stick with the stuff you know and that's the uh, the five canonical victims in the in the bay area we know those are zodiac absolutely 
Now, you, if you want to do Sherry Joe Bates separately, that's cool. But even though they could be linked, but but there's so many reasons to think that they're they're not that it's 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 going to be more of an impediment than a help to spend your time on Sherry Joe Bates if you're you trying to solve the You always have to investigate these cases individually. And if they come together organically, that's fine. But if you force them together, you're going to make mistakes. Right. Yeah. And and there is we are fortunate enough that in Sherry's case, you've got the greasy fingerprints on the 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 hood of the car. You've got DNA from hairs found in her what hand. Your cigarette butts. There's DNA off the watch. I mean, I'm here yeah. There's this. there's a lot of sources, and I'm sure Susanna can touch on this. We should get yeah. some. Yeah, in the Zodiac case itself. There may be DNA. What we don't know is if they've ever compared notes to say, hey, does your DNA match my DNA? Um, that's the, the million dollar question. Well, let's get Susanna's here. Let's see what she has to say about this and what she can talk about, what she can't. Hey, Susanna. Hi, guys. How's it going? Hey. hey. Hello. So, yeah, DNA. Um I would say overall, one of the most unfortunate things is that this evidence was not stored properly. So um, DNA is pr probably not your answer in this case. Um, uh oh, is yeah. this Sherry? Case <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how how was it that they were able to obtain DNA off of the stuff that they did in this case, then? and rule out? the suspect even well they didn't okay want so you're talking about the mitochondrial dna so that's different so mitochondrial dna there's thousands of copies of mitochondria per cell so you have a better chance of getting a result with mitochondrial dna so i have some questions about that you know i'm just looking at these reports today regarding the hairs um they did not even have enough of a dna they don't have a dna result for Sherry Joe herself. They haven't even excluded her as the source of the DNA. Now, wow. I do understand that the hairs were microscopically examined and said to be dissimilar from Sherry Joe. And it's less likely for a hair examiner to falsely exclude someone than falsely include someone. But we all know that hair examination has some issues, right? Our hair comparisons, not DNA testing, but microscopic hair comparisons. So that's number one. We don't even know for sure that these are not Sherry's hairs. Um, they don't. The, they were not able to get a result from her hairs. That's what. That's kind of what I'm going with. Like, I know that these items were were stored in a environment that was not conducive to retaining DNA. So most of the DNA is gone from all of these items. Um, I've seen that in my lab. I've seen that in other, other labs that have done testing, uh, where they're not getting results at all. Like there's nothing, there's zero DNA coming up from blood stains from the pants, for example. Oh, wow. So it was in a very hot environment. Riverside gets pretty hot in the summertime. And it was in, from my understanding, from what I've been told, the items were stored in a non-temperature controlled building that was exposed to heats and, you know, for how many years until testing was conducted. Um, but going back to the hairs that the FBI tested. So I, I also have questions because these are listed as, you know, blood being present as well. So I'm wondering how well they were clean. Now this is 1999 mitochondrial DNA, I'm sure they definitely tried to do a lot of washes to try to remove any residual blood. But I do have concerns of was all of that blood removed? So are we getting the DNA that is from the hair? Or are we getting residual DNA from blood that was on the hair? I don't know. Um, but if you're going to get any, I think if you're going to move forward with DNA in this case at all, there were four hairs that were in her hand. The FBI only tested one. So I would say, all right, let's get those other three hairs. Let's get to get them to Astria and do some uh, phenotyping on those hairs. That right. would be, I think, your best bet. Because even if it's really degraded, that's what they work with all the time. The, the DNA in rootless hairs is already extremely degraded. So that's your best chance of getting a result. Um, but everything else that I personally have 
either tested or looked at the results of, it's a big fat zero. Like it's that DNA is pretty much gone. Okay. So without DNA, what's our other option? A confession? Yeah. That's always good. <laughs> well, <laughs> hey, yeah. Not after Friends. they got away with it for this long and probably when the yeah. guy's dead. Right. He's probably if, he, if, he likely, doesn't, if he doesn't have prints on file by now, he's probably not going to ever have prints on What's, file. So. One, what year was this? 66? Yeah. Let's yeah. say he was about 20, so 1946. Uh, he's dead or on his way. Yeah, he's in his, yeah. Mm -hmm. He's older. Close, yeah, yeah, so, so I don't want to say, like, it's, it, you know, there's nothing left. I think that the hairs that were left in her hand, they're listed as um, four brown Caucasian head hair fragments. And those were, you know, examined and said to be dissimilar from Sherry Joe. So only one of those was tested. I think that's your best bet to go forward with right now. Um, I wonder about the latent prints that were pulled from the, the vehicle. Um, if they were, you know, once they have those and have those photographed and, and retained for comparison purposes, that might be a possibility for um, comparison. Maybe they were kept in a temperature control, you know, in a file room or something like that, where we might be able to get DNA. Now, well, if this guy was in the military, and, and mm -hmm. he printed, and he, it was yeah. his prints are on file with the military. Yeah. Right. Now, is yeah. that all automated, Cloyd? Yeah, well, I, I don't know that it's automated. That's a problem. No, I don't right. know, but yeah, it may be now. I, I don't. They could probably scan. That sounds too good to be true. If it is also, automated, it's it's partially automated, right? They didn't also, all, all those historical records. This no is way. this this is a, a big problem in the Zodiac case. There was a uh, a records department fire that destroyed a huge Military. amount of the air so, air forces right. uh, so, files so, that they had. So are in the same place. I, that I don't know. Yeah, and the other thing is, like Susanna, they haven't excluded her. Dig her up. Dig her up. Take her hair. And exclude her or include her, one of the two. Yeah, and and her brother's still alive. They could probably take his DNA as well mm -hmm. and, and do something with it. Yeah. Now that that's a good point because he would be expected to have the same mitochondrial DNA profile, assuming right. they have the same mother. Right. Then mm -hmm. he would have the same profile. That would be something that would easily be done more easily, obviously, than um, exhuming her. I did see where they had a reference like a blood stain reference, but I don't know where that is. If, if, you know, I don't know if they can locate it and if it was stored in the same conditions as, you know, so everything that's been used thus far has to try to get a standard from Sherry Joe has been considered what we call a secondary standard. So blood stains from her clothing, which typically, you know, I mean, I looked at the pants, there's blood all over them, but when the DNA testing is done, we're barely getting any, we're getting some results. I don't want to say we're not getting anything. There's some results, but it's low level. And the prior testing by the Riverside Lab, they were not able to get anything from a, a blood stain. And so that's a really good source of DNA. So if you can't get a result from a blood stain, that's just an indicator of how, you know, degraded the, the DNA is. So, you know, you can't get a result from that and you're trying to get it just from touch DNA. Um, so I have questions, you know, about the results that were obtained from the pants. Yeah, there is some male DNA present, but yep, they're there. <laughs> but I don't know if that was placed on those pants at the time that they were, you know, at the time of this crime, or if someone in 1966 or any of the many decades since came into direct contact with those pants mm. and deposited some of their DNA. Uh, and I have a question for you, Susanna, and, and yeah. I don't know if you know this offhand. I seem to recall that there, the hairs that were found in Sherry's hand weren't just hairs. There was actually blood clots, skin. Um, is that accurate? And would that, if, if it wasn't degraded, would, wouldn't that be a, a big help in, in getting more DNA? Well, yeah, but again, that's kind of my concern. It's probably her blood, right? right? And so was all of her blood properly and completely removed from the hair prior to the DNA analysis? So even if a very tiny amount was left behind, that could contaminate the results so that what you're seeing is a mitochondrial DNA profile from the blood 
and not from the hair. Now I'm not, you know, the FBI, they, they've been doing mitochondrial DNA on hairs for a very long time. They probably washed it many times to remove it, but that would be something I would want to know. And right now we don't know, we cannot compare because we don't have a reference. And again, they didn't ask for, from what I'm seeing, and there could be other things, but from what I'm seeing, there was no attempt to get a profile from a biological relative, like from her brother, to be able to, to, to say, like, all they can say right now is, well, that mitochondrial profile didn't match their suspect, but they don't even know if it excludes the victim. So that to me is an issue that that needs to be clarified so that we know, did we properly exclude this person or not? That was going to um, be one of my questions yeah. is what was the chances back then yeah. of the non-match to Barnett being accurate? Right. And, and normally I would say, you know, pretty good. I, like I said, I just, I, be, the two issues, the, the fact that this, these hairs were obviously in blood or in a blood clot and the fact that we don't have a known reference from Sherry to eliminate her um, we only have a hair comparison, which again, you know, maybe it's a good exclusion, but maybe not. I'd rather see a DNA than, it's than just subjective. a, yeah. right, right. Now, but the good news is there's additional hairs. So this is like the key mm -hmm. piece that I would say, let's move forward with that. That's what we'd want to test. Now the cigarette, butt, I, I know they can come be degraded to the DNA, but yeah. I understand that those filters are really good sources of DNA collecting. Is that accurate? Sure. Well, they are, but you know how much DNA is on this one? 42 picograms of DNA. That is oh, like wow. seven, seven cells worth of DNA. So it, it, wow. it's, and I know that because it, in the documents you provided me, there's a list of the concentration of DNA. It's 0 0.003 nanograms per microliter right. in 14 microliters. That's 42 picograms. That's There's six picograms per cell, like 6.6 .6 per cell. So that's a really low amount. Definitely would not have been able to get results in 99. Today, you might be able to, maybe a partial profile, but I guarantee you that this is not only, not only low level, but also degraded. So this doesn't tell you the level of degradation. So, I mean, you could certainly try to take that extract and go ahead and move forward with analysis if it hasn't been done. Um, but, but again, you know, there's some other samples, like I think people know from the history channel thing that I tested the pants. There were some other, there's at least one other item that was tested. And again, very little to, almost, you know, almost nothing coming up from that item that you would kind of anticipate getting a result from. So. Well, I think we should move forward with our level of degradation and bring on Drew Gray. <laughs> Speaking of degradation. Good segue. <laughs> there he is. There's the, wizard, the man behind the, the curtain. Wizard of Oz. Yeah. <laughs> How's it going, friends? Everyone, Drew is the guy that uh, does all of the switching on the show, um, brings up your slides and moves heads around. Makes it all run smoothly. Yeah, this is kind of weird. I'm not used to wearing pants during these shows. <laughs> <laughs> you can't tell that you are. I never wear pants during the show. <laughs> I know, like, what, what do you Wasted mean? What <laughs> pants? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that was, uh, that was pretty sad um, that, uh, that we can't we can't even know whether the the hairs uh, belong to Sherry Joe or the uh, or the assailant. That's uh, that's a crush. I mean, we blow. can. There's a way to do it. We can. It's just we don't have that based upon what I'm seeing. Maybe there was testing that was done later to compare her brother's DNA, and so maybe they definitely know that this is not Sherry's DNA. I, I can only speak to what I've seen, which is limited. And so there is a way to, to answer that question, though. So that's the good that's the good news, right? There's a way to answer that. Yes, but it if they can't know, then that tells us why they're still beating the dead horse with this suspect who should have been who everyone who most people believe was eliminated more than twenty years ago. And, and this Maybe that's why. Riverside is really really gung ho on this guy, and I yeah. um, I fear that. 
if there's anything that possibly doesn't make him look guiltier, I'm afraid they don't want to pursue that because I honestly don't think they want to know that it could be anyone besides him. I hate to say that. I asked but... a, I asked a friend of mine whose father was one of the detectives on Sherry Joe's case, Dave Bonine, um, and if you know if his dad ever talked about the case or anything like that, and even up until when he died in 2017 he would talk about the fact that, you know, they had their guy, they had their guy and they never could make it stick. And that was this Barnett character. I'm sure. Okay. Chloe, explain that to me. Cause I hear that a lot. It's like, we've got him. We know it's him. It's like, well, it, how can you know it's him if you don't have the evidence? Yeah, you don't. That's really a bad way to do this. You don't decide what the answer is and only look for information that matches your thesis. You have to, you can have a working theory. That's, there's no problem with that, but you have to be malleable. You know, if, if the evidence points you a different direction, you have to go the other direction. Right. And it's, it's a, it's a, a terrible error to decide what the answer is and then go try to find uh, something that matches what you think. So that, and that screws up more cases than you know, because, you know, the real person could be obvious, but because you're so focused on this other person, you go West Memphis three. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's not. Sure. It's not even just in criminal well, investigation. There was a firefighter right. that solved yeah. that case. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Inside joke with Susanna. That's all right. <laughs> I get it. Well, yeah. they they they've been gung ho about this guy since very early on, and, and they really have never let him go. Besides yeah. entertaining Zodiac for a couple minutes before. Dis yeah, discounting them. If, if we can't up. even confirm that these events, that this circumstantial evidence of him knowing Sherry Joe, dating her, having an argument, breaking him, her breaking up, if we don't even know if any of that is true, how can they be so gung ho and convinced mm -hmm. that he's the guy? Well, well so there's some of these witness uh, statements which are very incriminating and, to me, impossible to believe. And, of course, impossible to substantiate at this point. Exactly. So what kind of witness statements? Witnesses saying that uh, although he uh, went to work at midnight, at 6 a.m., he went into a diner and in sobbing uh, confession that he snuffed Sherry Joe. So he did he have any wounds or anything when he went into work? That wasn't known. Um, and because he wasn't a witness or he wasn't a suspect until 68, um, it's sort of a, a, a moot point. Some of the research that I looked at said that he didn't have scratches on him or anything, and we can't even tell if that's true. But did he own that watch? Does he have basic auto mechanics? Like we, we keep going. Does he match any of these things? Does, 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 the what about mechanic. his shoe size? Does his shoe size in right. that range? Yeah. I think he was. These, these are the good. things. These are the things that we don't know. And Rivers has been very tight-lipped. And you know, I have a, a, a million Zodiac files. I don't have much from Riverside though. Um, so they've kept everything close to the vest. And uh, you know, I I don't know. And I, I would think that it would it would match because they've been so gung ho on this guy for so long that maybe it did match, but we just don't know. One one thing I'd like to Lee, I'd just like to point out that you don't have to have a lot of mechanical knowledge to know that if you pull a coil wire, the car won't start. I have almost zero. Yeah, but Knowledge well, I have less than you because I would just I just like be pulling random stuff out. Though this yeah. probably won't work, and it probably works, <laughs> uh, especially on a Volkswagen, which is a very rudimentary <laughs> engine. You know, right. the yeah. you pull it, it's not going to start. And I even know that. I know mm. <laughs> good old fashioned German engineering, simple, right. straight yeah. to the point, yeah. mechanical. Yeah, give me a yeah. German. Engineering. It's it's something we can't really look into um, because we don't have the police reports and because we're keeping this gentleman's uh, identity a secret. But according to Ken Maines, mm -hmm. who, uh, who has read these uh, police reports, um, this guy had, uh, had a bit of a criminal history. I don't know if it was car, if he was a car thief, 
but uh, his crimes did involve automobiles. And uh, apparently he once wrote an angry letter to an old professor, uh, which is uh, apparently what got him on the radar to begin with. <laughs> and then apparently he had an interview uh, with police where he somewhat inserted himself into the case by saying that he was in fact at the diner where Sherry Jo and her father had breakfast that morning. And he said that Sherry Jo's father bought him breakfast. And <laughs> Sherry Jo's father said that's not true. Now, is this secondhand or this is confirmed? This, this, story? this is Ken Maine's discussing what he read in the police reports in the reports okay that we don't have access to right now, and and it's not a crime to move overseas now, i always wondered why this guy what brought him overseas i think he's living in the uk if i remember or south america i don't even remember do you remember what it was drew i want to say south america i'm gonna say hawaii I, I thought it was someplace outside of the united states but i could be wrong um I think but I always good. wondered what brought him there. What, 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 why would he move out of the states unless he had family or work that brought him there? And they well, only got they only got his DNA when he came back to visit someone. Um, mm -hmm. That's when they stopped him at the airport. So, um, yeah. Well, it's um, he may have moved several times. I'm not sure. At the age of uh, twenty or 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 just under. He could have been pursuing career goals. I don't really know. Yeah, yeah. And, does, and that's does the he thing. have a, a UK connection? That's my yeah, was he in the UK before where he got the watch. The that's watch. What we're just thinking. Yeah. yeah. You know. You know. That's one thing I never did. I never looked. I, I know who this guy is, and I never looked at his family. Maybe I could go back one day when I have some spare time and check out his family a little bit and see if they had a military history. Uh, if they were stationed, because I could find out his dad's information pretty easily. Well, you know that Zodiac is a Brit theory, right? Have a happy mm -hmm. Christmas. Yeah. 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 <laughs> now, well, this, uh, I, ironically, this guy was actually checked out to see if his writing matched Zodiac's too, mm -hmm. and it didn't. So, but I think we, what we already talked about, who knows about the writing now at this point. So let's go back to something um, when we talked about a maintenance man or someone that may have been able to earn her trust, even if she didn't know him. And Drew, you told me something else that Ken Maines uh, talked about from the police reports. And that was that the boot sole pattern matched yeah. the boot sole pattern of Cleo Martin, the janitor or the yeah. groundskeeper who found the body. Yes, now they couldn't match match it because they only have a heel print, which is why right. they uh, described the size between eight and ten. Uh, but apparently, he had that that same make of shoe. And, and just to point out, I'll point this out for you. And Lee, you'll find this interesting because you had a vibe for who might have done this. This guy was a, I, I want to say he was seventy. He was old, he was an old mm. black black man. Um, this oh, okay. janitor. So mm -hmm. I I know that probably doesn't you know jog with your uh, your interpretation of who did this crime. Mm, I don't like who I don't like to, I don't like to revise, but if it is a maintenance man, then I would revise that because if he can be, you know what I mean, if he's trusted because of his position, then I could see I could see him being black. How about this? How about I was thinking if it's a fellow student that socializes with her and knows her, probably white. But if we're going with a maintenance man, I'm actually fine with black. But what about 70 years old? Oh, he was 70 at the time? No, he wasn't. No, that's, that guy didn't do it. Yeah, no. yeah I, 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 I still, uh, I'm still not convinced that she knew the gentleman. Um, I, I just can't think of any reason why she would leave her windows down, uh, doors unlocked, keys in the ignition, and go anywhere with anyone. Unless she there just was a forgot weapon. the keys. She I, was I don't know. Why, why do you think happened then, Drew? What's what's the theory? I think she was led away by a knife or a gun. Mm -hmm. And so, it, and she, what, decided to fight against it in the alley? Yeah, I think it was an attempted abduction, and that she mm -hmm. either decided 
it was her only chance to fight back in the middle of the alley or for some reason uh, the gentleman made his, uh, his move at that point. But I, I think the intention um, was, was to get her into his, his automobile and that it, it simply didn't work out. Uh, I'd back up a bit though and say that it, although there's uh, clearly some premeditation I don't know how anyone uh, outside of her small circle of uh, immediate friends could know that she was going to the library that night. So I think although he uh, planned to disable her vehicle so that he could assault her, um, that he was not fully prepared. I don't, I don't know if anyone uh, wants to commit a, a murder with a, uh, a three inch knife. So I think there was some spontaneity. And she did tell her, at least her, her one friend that she invited to go with, that she was going. Um, I don't know who else <laughs> might have known or caught or got wind of it. How I mean, isn't it possible that someone just happened to drive by? I mean, I don't know how visible this parking lot is, but it seems to be a pretty noticeable vehicle. If you know this person already and you're like, oh, she's at the library, you know, like then. She was parked on the street in, okay. in a car that was uh, unusual. Uh, right. They say lime green, but I think it was actually mist green based on a uh, uh, it's hard to miss. Right. It but looks mint to me, to but that's an old 1966 photo. They certainly they certainly wrote lime green in the uh, in the reports, so yeah. that's what we'll go mm -hmm. with. But at any rate, anyone who knew Sherry Jo, and when I say knew, I mean knew she worked at a bank, uh, saw her around town, uh, could have recognized that car while driving by. Maybe they followed her there. But yeah, and it, uh, they didn't necessarily have to have a, uh, a close relationship. And if this killer right. wrote the letter, the letter strongly implies that it was another student or certainly someone in their life. Uh, so why would the killer offer that up if that was the truth? I don't want to proceed that right. that letter has any bearing, though. I think we should just... Take yeah, that I, that's it's that's tough. Uh, but it, but if you do want to eliminate it, I I think we can probably eliminate the zodiac discussion as well. Yeah, that we'd have. Well, to. Yeah, we we probably should because it, well, how is it going to help? Let's put it that way. How does it being zodiac help us? Oh, well, well, I mean, sure it, 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 yeah. it, it could if you could identify someone that was in Riverside at the time and then link them later on as being in Vallejo or San Francisco. Although that's always with all, the whole all of power, this this person hasn't been found, right? With exactly. Mm -hmm. So I've 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 spent millions of hours looking for people that wound up from Riverside and Vallejo, and it's just you'll you'll go mad trying to mm. track all them down. And by the way, that the, the custodian was fifty at the time, not seventy. Mm. I was off nah, on my age. I still don't wow. really like it. No, I, I think when you're fifty. I don't know now because now I, I'm thinking about everything again. Like maybe he didn't plan on attacking her there. He planned on leading her somewhere else, and then she reacted. And so then maybe his whole thing about killing her there um, it was it was reactive more than instrumental. So it wasn't like oh I stab her once and she dies. He wasn't even thinking about that because he had to react to what <coughs> he was doing. So yeah, it is it is a bit tricky. Um, okay, so hold on, Drew. Let's go back to, to your scenario. Or, um, so he disables her car before she gets there, right? In your scenario? Before she uh, leaves the library? Bef before she arrives at the car. and she, He doesn't encounter her, start talking to her, and then disable her car. He disables her car. Um, and so that he can her... have the opportunity to play Good Samaritan. Okay. Or at least stop her from leaving the premises. Okay. And so if that's the case, why does he then have to lead her away at, at knife point? Why can't he just trick her? He's leading her to his car. Okay, but if you're just going to pull, if you're going to do it at knife point anyway, anyway, why disable her car? Uh, as opposed to assaulting her in the car. Well, you're going to wait around to see when she comes out and her car doesn't work. Why do you screw with her car? Why don't you just pull a knife on her and say, "Come with me"? Because that's what you're saying happened, right? Yes. Uh, I guess the question is is 
if you did want to disable the car, where would you wait? Would you wait in the alleyway where a man smoking a cigarette was found at pretty much the right time, we assume? Sounds good to me. Uh, because You don't want to be seen because you know there's going to be yeah. a murder, so you don't want to be seen lurking around either, right? But you can't be too far out of sight. But he's at the opposite side of her car. So if he's in the alley and she comes out um, before... Uh, everyone has absconded, then uh, someone else could help her with her car. So he well, that's the question. There. How does he know he's gonna? She's gonna stay till nine, too, right? It, it seems like that. But maybe, yeah. but maybe he does because he's there all the time and observed her. Are those her habits? What are her habits? This is an important. Her thing. habits she... were to study at home. Yeah, okay. and oh. she ah, tried okay. to. Bring somebody so, with her as well right. to, to study. Okay, so this is this is an, an anomaly. This is not a pattern. Her being mm -hmm. there that night is an anomaly. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So I, I don't think I don't think we can rule out somebody just seeing a bright green car with an attractive blonde girl on it and just following her and saying, Absolutely. "Oh, she's going to the library. I'm going to walk over and disable her car." And then, you know, maybe he's Wait. got ten. Maybe she doesn't really know him. But he's looks like Ted Bundy. He's a good looking guy. He, she's not afraid of him, whatever. And she lets her guard down. And he's like, okay, I'll go in this alley with this guy. I just don't think she's walking to that alley with Otis Tool. Um, somebody and, creepy like that. Agreed. And he just yeah. gets lucky that she stays till the very end of the night. Well, maybe he was waiting waited. the whole time. Wait, Why wouldn't he just waiting. wait the whole time? Well, I didn't say yeah. he didn't wait. Mm -hmm. Especially, but, I think but, but, but he gets lucky that there's that most of the people have left right at nine. But maybe yeah. that's why he had to. I mean, personally, I don't. I mean, I'm no criminologist, but I don't. I it seems to me the point of disabling the vehicle was to be play the good Samaritan and then get gain her trust and get her to be led away. And I think that we have to look at the time as well. You're talking about 1966 when they're saying there's very little to no crime. I mean this 18 year old, is she going to be a little bit more trusting and say, Oh, okay. You have, you know, jumper cables, you have what, you know, right. whatever she thinks is wrong. Yeah. Oh, okay. Let's go get them from your car and just go off. But I, I, think, I think, yeah, I think we agreed on that though. Right. Mm -hmm. But what, well, what Drew's saying I, is he I, think I, that yeah. she, well, we did, but then Drew's saying that he thinks that this guy pulled a knife on her yeah. and I'm saying, what is the point then? Of I the well, I, one point would be to buy time. How much? Like, Half enough that she doesn't get in her car and drive off before he can do before he can get to her but he's just lingering around there anyway you can assume right he'd be kind of stupid if he didn't but was he, he gonna come by every 15 minutes so she's sitting in her car still how much he can he be lingering around these parking spaces at the time when all of these other students or people are coming out of the library and going to the same location i think quite a bit I would agree. Well, you know, if if he's the guy that the the girl saw, he was in the shadows, but between the two buildings, smoking a cigarette. Maybe he's hanging out there in the darkness, waiting to see her walk to her car. I have a solution to this. Of course, he has to linger on because if she's going to go come, find the car doesn't work, and then she's going to go off and try and solve the problem. So he has to be in the orbit because he's got to think. Well, she's going to go off and try and solve this problem. Then I can't get her either. So he has yeah. to be floating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if uh, I mean if the library is open, that's going to be her first stop. She goes to her, her car; it doesn't start. She goes into the library and either gets some help or makes a phone call. There's no yeah. pay phones. But you don't want her to go back to right. the library because now everyone's on alert. So what you want right. to do is intercept her, and that means you mm -hmm. linger. So that means you you're there. And if you don't know what time she's going because she doesn't have a pattern, as you just said, and you don't know her, as if you suggested that possibility, then the only thing you have is an orbiting guy who doesn't know her. It, 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 it within those parameters. Yeah, see what I'm getting at? Okay, so then mm -hmm. he, he, can't, he can't be like coming by checking every 15 minutes. Right. And so then he disables the car not to buy time, but as a ruse. Mm -hmm. Sorry, this is, <laughs> this is <laughs> flowing the breadcrumbs back home now. Yeah. And then, and then it goes back to if this was a good friend of hers, let's say someone she knew well, he probably wouldn't have to even disable the car. He could just say, hey, um, you know, let's go talk or, or whatever. This seems like someone did that to to buy that time. Let's go have what was that? The, uh, so let's go have a malt. 
<laughs> let's, let's go listen. Not in 1966. Well, in Riverside, it probably did. Mal Malta's are a 1940s, <laughs> 50s thing. Um, one thing that uh, Drew told me was that possibly the co-worker from the bank that Sherry Jo called about the term paper, her name was Donna. And according to Drew, Donna dated this Barnett character. Drew, you want to talk a, a little bit about According that? to an anonymous email sent to Tom Voigt of uh, ZodiacKiller.com. So basically with this case, we are looking at sources that are not primary. We're looking at anecdotal evidence with just about everything going back to the inside detective article. Yeah. Soup to nuts. Should we but look at some comments? Fortunate. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Some comments. Okay. Throw those up. Cause we gotta, we gotta move toward the scrum. I think. Kathy Arnott says, even if the clocks were right, if she knew him in passing, he may have talked to her for a while. If there were greasy fingerprints, he may have led her on by pretending to try to fix it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's we agree with that, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he could have just been like, oh, I can't fix it. I don't know what it is. You're going to have to come with me and I'll give you a ride. Rebecca. Right. My, thinks my car is in the alleyway. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, yeah. Yeah. Well, the only problem with uh, this one here is that she could have called. Well, read it out, Drew, because we got audio people. Right. Audio. Uh, Rebecca Casella says, I also believe that she knew him, even in passing, because she could have easily called her father for help. Uh, there was no payphone on, at the street. Right. So she could go into the library if it was still open. But um, Evidence seems to push us to uh, at least uh, nine o'clock for the attack. So where would the closest payphone be? I don't really know. I don't know that anyone knows. Uh, the mm -hmm. question has certainly been asked. Um, perhaps that was her motive for going through the alley. But again, why? Why is she leaving her uh, her car unattended in the in her keys in the right. alley? Right. Uh, that's and I a, would imagine there would have been a payphone somewhere on the campus. You would think. I would doubt that she would have to leave campus, go through an alley or whatever to get to a payphone. Yeah, it just comes down to it. She's not going to leave her keys in the car. So she didn't go to get a payphone. So that's right. It's, it's not even worth asking the question. Next one. Renee Brown says, good points. If they knew each other, even casually then she would trust him over going back into the library to ask a stranger. Yeah. And he's right in front of her, so the easier solution, so to speak. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Lisa Gray. Maybe sometimes she was in class, but I feel like that person would be noticeable after the fact. Change behaviors are not showing up to class. Yes, I agree. I was thinking about this. I should have said this. Um, this is the kind of person that um, might have left town, might have um, become disheveled, started drinking more after this. Um, yeah. Well, it's it's interesting about Ross Sullivan because the library staff that worked with him, they all immediately, as soon as she was killed, said, you got to check this guy out. We think it was him. And they said, if he doesn't show up here at school for the next couple of days or something we're going to be even more suspicious well, sure enough he didn't show up right and he always wore the same clothes and when they finally saw him again a week or two later he was wearing a different outfit than he always wore mm -hmm. and they were even more suspicious of him because of those reasons because right. he did change his uh his um you know the way he was acting and the, his pattern I like Ross Sullivan, but he's six foot two and we have size eight to 10 shoes. So I want to know his shoe size. Yeah. But if and I don't, if, I, I don't, I was just going to say too, I don't think he, he was 260 pounds too and, and big. And I right. don't think he would have had much of a problem fighting with, with Cherry Joe. Hmm. Yeah. I was going to say about the shoes though. I mean, do we know those are definitely from the attacker or are those like, we're saying maybe possibly from the person who located her. So is that another Good point. You know, red herring? Uh, so this is what happened. I don't know. You don't, <laughs> don't control the crime scene properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like mm -hmm. so many unsolved cases where it's just 
I'm doing this with John Bonet Ramsey right now, too. Okay. Mm. Well, who knows then? <laughs> Crime mm. scene's compromised. Basically, I have no evidence in that yeah. case. Well, then you go back to the watch. The watch, you know, there's been debate about what size a, a man might be that wears a size seven watch. Um, you know, I recall debating whether Ross that could fit him or not. Um, okay. I, yeah. I, I think I think it would tend to be a medium sized guy. Not necessarily a larger guy that would wear that kind of band, um, mm. but I, I think that's a clue there too. We have to assume that came from the killer, um, that it wasn't just a stray watch that someone dropped there one day and it just happened to be next to her body. I, I think we have to assume that came off the killer. So that is probably the the biggest, most solid clue that watch. Yes, and it's the clue that allows me to sort of. Um... Uh, you always want to uh, consider these witness statements, but the one about the uh, two people who are seen with flashlights going back to the scene of the crime in the middle of the night, presumably looking for something incriminating, they could not have missed the watch. Ten feet away from, from the body, it's, it's just not possible. In the dark? With flashlights? I think they could have missed it. I think they could have missed it, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a dark band unless they caught the glim, glimmer of the I, watch face and the quartz. I, buy the, I just don't hand. buy the whole story. I don't buy the whole story of them going back there and this happening in the first place. Who's right. who's going to take a chance on going back, walking around with flashlights around a dead body that, and then somebody stumbling upon you and saying, what are you doing here? I, I just don't buy that whole story. Yeah, and Lee, you're a good buddy of mine. I just killed someone, and I think I left something at the crime yeah. scene. Help me find my watch. <laughs> Well, now, I'm one of the, the few people that really appreciates what friendship means, but I, everyone yeah. else, I mean, yeah. you probably would this, actually. I bet you would. Is go the with source me. of this story, Drew, and, and please, I, I can't remember now. Is the source of this flashlight story the same guy that says that he confessed to him? I don't know if it's the him? same guy. I, I want to say he same. supposedly was the guy that was helping at the scene, if, if my memory serves. That this was supposedly right. the same friend. Let's bang out a few more comments and then scrum it. Should we do that? Yeah. Okay. Right. Disconnecting the coil. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. You... Disconnecting the coil wire would not drain the battery. The confession letter author didn't seem to know that. Yeah, that's something I I, I learned is, is that, and I am nowhere near a car that's person, right? right. Yeah. But apparently when you disconnect it, you're not, killing the battery you're you're just severing the connection spark and and yeah. and yet the uh the author of the confession letter s stated that he went That's inside right. the library the charger, the starter. Yeah, you're just interrupting the electrical it doesn't drain the battery yeah right um and so he may guess... not have known that he may not have been, been mechanically inclined either he just assumed that it killed the battery yeah, um, or maybe he knows what to call it. The car. Like if you're if you're right. like me and you literally have no auto mechanics, I'm gonna just go in and pull stuff out, right? But I don't know what what I'm pulling out. I'm not later gonna say it was yeah. the the. But hold on, that was in the newspaper, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, but, except but then, the letter author said the middle wire, which is the coil wire, which is no, the wire right, which cool. is the coil wire. Yeah. So I, I don't think that tells us one way or another if he's an expert. Um, with mechanics no. no and and uh as cloyd says you don't need to be uh, a car mechanic to to understand how to disable a vw um, what else we got here this is from rebecca did he maybe try convincing her to go out with him and when she refused he flipped out and killed her disabling her car so that he could come to rescue her and thinking she'd be grateful for it. Yeah. Sounds uh, reasonable. Definitely possible. Me. Definitely possible. Maybe he figures that's the time I need with her to convince her that I'm worthy of her going out on a date with me and it didn't go so well. And, mm, okay. you know, she okay. rebuffed but him. Especially if he had um, tried on multiple occasions and been rejected. On multiple okay. occasions. So the car was disabled in this scenario, not as a, a pretext to get her to go with him so he can kill her, her, 
but for him to come in as a white knight and win her um, affection, and then that goes sideways, and then it becomes a reactive homicide. Or that's, either or. Maybe it's, it's one of those scenarios, yeah. I, I think it's clear that it, it's probably one of those two scenarios. I think it's less likely, but, I mean, it could be. Let's just go through... Well, let's go through other details. There's probably some clue in there with, that will tell us one way or the other what that is. Um, so, so he just so maybe, those keys. Maybe that's why he only had a small knife. It sounds like a small knife. You know? May, like if, a pocket knife. Yeah. I mean, I because I've kind of mm -hmm. thought that as well. Like, did he not maybe necessarily intend to kill her, but something triggered him to do so? And and one thing, too, I don't think we mentioned it. Didn't he say that the knife broke, Drew? He did in the and confession it, That letter. wasn't the case. That was not the case. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't we can't really know that. Uh, the confession letter author said uh, he stabbed her and the knife broke. He doesn't specify whether it was the handle. He doesn't specify whether he retrieved it, possibly at night with flashlights. No. Uh, there was no knife blade found in, in Sherry Joe yeah. or okay. at the scene. Uh, it's a curious detail to make up if you're trying to convince authorities that you committed a crime. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, it's hard for me to... Uh, completely uh, drop the idea that the killer wrote the letter uh, for one thing. Oh, no, there's... I don't, I don't think we, we, I'm not saying he didn't. I'm just saying like, it's more red herrings than it is of use. I yeah. think. Yeah. I don't think he would have sent it if it was going to lead people to his identity. Yeah. Um, and, and if you really had been rebuffed by her and she had brushed you off over the years, why would you volunteer that information in this letter saying exactly. I was making her pay for the time she brushed me off? You're, that's confirming a link to that. Yeah, now, exactly. this, is, this brings me back to the question. This has always brought me back to the question. If you're a stranger to Sherry, you don't need to send that letter and explain anything because you're a stranger. You're not going to be connected. Right. If you are someone that knows her, why would you mention brush offs in the years past? Because then that's going to have them looking at people in her circle. So I, I, I flip flop back and forth on is this a stranger or is this but he doesn't have to because... be in her circle, not Sprint. in her close circle. No. If you look at stalker type behavior, you can have a per the, the subject can have a perceived relationship, perceived interactions with the victim over and over where um, the victim no. wouldn't have any idea any of this was going on around them. Some guy in her class, right? Yeah. yeah. You could easily be a classmate, um, someone that's maybe a year or two above her in college, also a student there. Um, I, I, the, at the end of the day, I just don't see her walking into the dark alley with an oddest tool looking guy, a creep. She would just as easily go to the library. And, you know, so at the very least, this had to be someone that was probably in her age group, looked normal look like her she knew him if you knew him casually I, I think they need to look in that circle of people not some mm. even that looking. though it would not explain her leaving the keys behind yeah she must she yeah. must have yeah. known uh that she was not in control when she left that vehicle no uh, or or she had such trust that she she yeah. really thought she was just going somewhere very briefly yep or, and be because yeah, or, Drew, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Because the car can't be stolen because it doesn't work. Yeah. That, that's right. exactly was, what I was going to say. Yeah. Right. Was she, was just, she was just nervous about the whole situation and just forgot the keys there. It could be something as that's simple what, as that. It's possible. So. I don't know how yeah. many times I've locked my keys in my car because I forgot yeah. to take the damn keys out of the ignition. Um, I don't, I don't. I think moving away from this, she knew him and had a personal relationship with him. I'm feeling somebody that she knew or believed she could trust. Like someone who worked there, someone who presented themselves as a person of assistance or authority. It's why I keep going back to a maintenance type person. Um, somebody who she would have expected to be on the campus and oh. would not have raised an eyebrow when they offered her assistance. If they offered me, her assistance, let me ask you a question. Be a professor, right? Yeah. I'm just while we're doing this, we yeah. can come up with all kinds of roles and and such. It's yeah. 
Would she have gone to the trouble of lifting the hood to at least look at the engine? Don't know. I, I think if a guy was there, there the if a guy was there, she probably would have let the guy do it. Oh, for sure. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If some guy she was like, yeah. no, like no, no, yeah. he's no, probably that, like, right. Crank no, that the, changes crank everything now. All. Once you realize she she goes, well, the car's not going to get stolen anyways because it doesn't work, right? Which yeah. I, I don't know why it took me that long to figure that out. But yeah, of course. Then why is she going to care about the yeah. keys? But it's, it, it, you know, I personally, I think even if I left my car there that wasn't working, I think I'd still bring my keys with me just as a habit. But, but this was 1966. Yeah. That's, this wasn't the 70s. Point. It wasn't the 80s. Uh, people were a lot more trusting. They left their cars unlocked. They didn't yeah, yeah. I mean, she probably, thousand dollar stereos in them and things like right. that. She probably expected someone to help her to come to her aid. You know, I mean, that was I, I don't think that would be surprising in that time and that place for I mean, for for people to step up. And, and she just thinks that this is some person helping her because she's having car troubles, not knowing that this is probably the right. person that caused the car trouble. You right. Know? Why so would you remember, you she wouldn't. was only 18. She just that, graduated exactly. high school the year before. She wasn't a 24 year old grad student or somebody yeah. who is a little more savvy. She was a child in her mind. She was still living with her, living at home. So for her being a kid, she would expect to get help from someone. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's there's a danger though in uh, painting this community as as crime free though. Uh, a year earlier, another girl had been stabbed on campus okay. by Good a point. man who was who was uh, you know still doing uh, time during this crime. Hmm. Okay. And wasn't and, there after after Sherry's yep. case? Wasn't there another guy that claimed? That terrorized another girl and claimed that he had killed Sherry. Remember that he didn't, story, Drew? He didn't. Yeah, he didn't claim that he'd killed Sherry, but he uh, accosted a woman. I'm not sure if there was uh, uh, car trouble involved, but he actually brought up the um, Sherry, the, the Sherry's murder, and saying, "You know, I'm I'm not uh, Jack the Ripper. I didn't uh, kill that girl last year, or whatever." Hmm. And uh, um, and at some point he pulled out a knife and I think he did stab her, but she survived. I don't know. Yeah. There's a, and there's an, another case and I, I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but there's another case down in Southern California of a girl named Sonny Dagowitz. Um, and I, I want to say this was 1967 in Los Angeles, but don't, don't hold me to that. She was murdered in her college parking garage um stabbed to death i don't remember all the details but um so not that far away there's another girl being murdered in her college uh campus uh by by being stabbed so i always wondered if it could be possible yeah. that this person was the same person someone said that sherry was afraid of the dark and uh and she loved her car she took really good care of it uh apparently she had just washed it like two days previously which uh makes these fingerprints you know certainly from the evening in question she washed her own car that i don't know hmm. well if somebody was digging around under that hood and there's fresh grease prints on there you have to assume it was the person digging around under the hood that that left those prints right but if she yeah. was willing to wash her own car and didn't have somebody do that for her it tells you a little bit about her own investment, her own hands-on approach to her vehicle. I think she probably did look under the hood. And if you do, you don't have to be a mechanic to, to see the, uh, the dangling wire. Something disconnected, right? And maybe that's when the, uh, the weapon comes out and uh, uh, we go, she's forced we, we, to leave. We go back to, though, is this person hovering and he hears that car crank and not yes, start. The answer is yes. Runs over, runs over Johnny on the spot. Hey, what's going on? Is your car not starting? And maybe she never got a chance to even get out of the car and check out her own under the hood. Yeah, it's yeah. possible. There's also the uh, the curious detail of her handbag under her body. I always thought that was that was Can, strange. Let's save some stuff for the scrum. Can we yeah. throw up one more comment? Can we take Doug McGregor's? Put that up. Ooh. Sure. Doug, the geographic profiler. 
if she normally studies at home, then routine activities theory would come into play. Okay, so I, I mean, that's not what I know of routine activities theory. Uh, maybe it's another version of it, but I'm talking about her routines. Well, uh, even yeah. people who knew her routines, uh, even her father didn't know she was going to uh, the library until he read her note. Uh, so unless we're looking in her very immediate uh, friend circle, that had to be happenstance. And again, I don't think we can rule out somebody passing by, seeing her in that car and making a U-turn and following her. Um and not necessarily stalking her. Yeah. I think it's more likely somebody saw her get out of the car that was already on campus to get a good look at her and how attractive she was than somebody who sees her driving in the car. And according mm -hmm. to Drew, we don't have confirmation that those cars were actually following. Um, Correct. Car it's from a pretty, that followed her. It's from a pretty media source. It, it could have been just a uh, someone that's going to the library themselves, too, you know? Mm -hmm. So, Well, why don't we bring Ashley up so she can give her Patreon shout-out and then scrum. head over to the Scrum. Scrum. All right. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to give a big thank you to our wonderful patrons, and if you're considering joining them, here's the deal. The Nancy Drew tier gives you ad-free episodes, bonus content, and the Scrum. The Scrum is an after-hours with our hosts and guests where the conversation continues. The Columbo tier contains the perks of the first, plus a guarantee that at least one of your comments or voicemails will be heard on the show. The Poirot tier contains the perks of the first and second, plus access to a quarterly private session where members will join and interact with one or more hosts to discuss cases not explored on the show. Think of it as a masterclass where you and the hosts dig even deeper into your pet case. The fourth and final is Sherlock Holmes, which contains all perks so far, plus a VIP pass to any special in-person event where you can meet and hang with the hosts of Citizen Detective. As we grow, there will be a lot more coming your way. Watch this space. Please remember also that your help keeps the citizen detective ship afloat. Head on over to www.patreon.com slash citizen detective. Citizen detective streams every two weeks on YouTube at citizen D pod on Twitter at citizen detective podcast on Facebook and twitch.tv slash citizen detective. Now back to the show. Thank you, Ashley. So such a, a big case to try and dissect in such a short period of time. Um, it's one of the challenges of, of a case this big. You want to take us out and take us over to the scrum morph? Yeah, so right now as we head over to the Scrum, it is time to wrap up the main show, but you know that's the benefit of being a patron. You'll be able to come over and join us in the Scrum. And we're going to be back in two weeks, and we'll launch a short series covering the canonical Zodiac murders and you know phasing this case into the Zodiac case. We'll begin with the 1968 murders of David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen, as well as the 1969 attack on Michael Mageau, and Darlene Farron. And again, we're talking a really big mystery here. So join us next time. Until then, a big thanks for everyone for joining us and good night. We'll see you in the scrum. And we are in the scrum. The scrum. Everybody but Lee. Lee yeah. loves the scrum, but he's the last one here. Yeah. Cloyd's over there trying to get me in trouble, sending me text messages, <laughs> making me laugh. <laughs> He's a troublemaker, I tell you. Got to watch him. Yeah, I think we know that now. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs>
I do want to say um, regarding, I know you guys, and I probably should have said this in the regular part. I do want to say that Riverside now, I think is a completely different agency. And I know that they are trying, um, you know, they have not given up on this case and they are still actively working and pursuing this case. So I, I was trying to find an opportunity to say that and I, I didn't want to interrupt. It just didn't fit in exactly. But like I, like I said, I just wanted to say that because I know that they are, you know, they are still working this case so, as well as many other cold cases. So, so do you know, know if there's, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's, it's good to know that they're looking at it with fresh eyes and fresh yeah. open mind and not the same, you know, blinders they had for a long time. That was my question. Are they looking at it? Uh, you know, I mean, with fresh I don't eyes know or are they still hell bent on investigations wise, you know, like what they're doing, uh, boots on the ground type of work. I don't know, but DNA testing, I mean, certainly it's, it's, it's more of what can we possibly get a DNA profile from? I mean, we do have, I mean, there is additional evidence that is, you know, sitting in my lab right now. So, right. you know, I mean, it's, it's, but the, the problem again is that, it just from what I've seen, it's, it's just extremely degraded. And I, I've worked some other Riverside cases and had similar, similar issues. So I think that at that time, you know, depending on the age of the case at that time, they just didn't, you know, they just weren't storing it properly. That's what they right. had available and that's where it got stored and, and it was detrimental. So, so when you I, I were, uh, when you uh, were approached to do the documentary, the hunt for the Zodiac uh -huh. killer, and is that when you received the pants? Was that your first? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. How frustrated were you at finding? <sighs> yeah. So the, I mean, first I went to the Riverside um, uh, Police Department and met with the agents and talked about the evidence and discussed the evidence with them first. That was, you know, when they knew that the show was going to be going on and that they could get this testing done basically pro bono, they wanted to talk with me first to see, you know, what is even worthwhile in testing. Um, I mean, and the pants, like when you look at the evidence, it looks great. It looks like it's going to be in fantastic condition, but just like I said, I think because of the storage conditions, it, it was, it, mm -hmm. it wasn't. So when, at that time, I was not back in the lab, so I had to send the DNA. The I did MVAC collection, right? And so I did. Um, I mean, I also collected some specific blood stains, but I MVAC certain areas. But when the results came back, because at that point I was not working in the lab yet, or again, I should say. Um, so it was. Um, when they couldn't get a complete profile from the blood stain, and once I talked with the detectives and they were like, yeah, our lab wasn't able to get anything from the pants. I was pleased that we got something, right? So the MVAC did pick up some DNA and it did pick up some male DNA. Um, you know, the documentary, I kind of had an issue with because on the phone, you know, I had a phone call with the the detectives working on the case and I was like, yeah, these results are inconclusive. I mean, that's what the report is. The report is they can't be compared to anyone and they cut it to make it sound like I said, yeah, yeah. sure. You can compare. Right. Like, they, yeah. so, something I, <laughs> I found about the document yeah. is that they built everyone up <laughs> yeah. for major results coming in. Yeah. yeah. And so they then like they had to cut it off and shut it down when the results were not coming in. And it, yeah. I think people were expecting a second season. They did that, like, oh, that Homer TV Simpson magic. Thing. Don't <laughs> that yeah. Simpsons episode. Well, yeah, it will be solved next season. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> basically, yeah. yeah. I now, was... I would say that the DNA, there could be something done with that DNA today. At the time, because I know that the, the lab that it went to did not have um, probabilistic genotyping at the time. I mean, this is 2017, so there weren't as many labs. So what their results say in their report, you know, look, it's there's some male DNA, but it's inconclusive. Today, if there was a viable suspect, that those results could be compared using probabilistic genotyping. That those results could be sent to um, Cybergenetics, who has the true allele system, because they can take data 
that um, is older, like on a different platform, an older amplification kit, and and do the analysis, do the probabilistic genotyping. So if at some point there is a suspect or the suspect that they have now, they could certainly compare that with what they had from, uh, the, from the pants and from one additional item that I tested that, that was not discussed. In so are you show. saying that between 2017 and now, advancements mm -hmm. have come that far? Sure. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah because- no, not to say that it did not exist at that time. It's just not as many labs were using ah. uh, this software program that allows you to look at low level data. So a lot of times we had to say, I look, see. it's low level. It's an inconclusive mixture. There's nothing I can do with it. Whereas today we can use all of that low level data to, to be able to make some comparisons. Are you in any kind of touch with them to say, hey, it's been five years. We might be able to do X, Y, and Z that we couldn't do last time. Are you in touch with Riverside? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Yes, I am. Um, so I, I am not – when the case came in, it was assigned to someone else. So uh, someone else in the lab is working the case. But I can certainly, you know, reach out. And, you know, I mean, it's something I haven't really – thought about for a little while, but after, you know, talking with you guys today, or for example, I never saw that FBI report regarding the the hairs. So if I had known about that, that's something that I would have passed on to them wow. before and said, well, there's three additional hairs that it doesn't look like were tested. Let's, let's get those to Astrea Forensics and, and see if we can get a SNP profile or first compare it to the brother's DNA to make sure, number one, confirm it's not Sherry Joe's profile. If it's not, then let's figure out whose it is and let's do genetic uh, right. genealogy. So I, I think that that's, I mean, I'll, I'll, yeah, I mean, I can email her tonight. You know, so that's, yeah. that's, Just, uh, I, you know, night and day between now and five mm -hmm. years ago, I, I think you're, mm -hmm. you're hitting the nail right on the head. There's just so many more opportunities now than, than there were when the show was made. Yeah. Looking at the yep. pictures of Sherry Jo over the years, um, I know it said that she was blonde, but she didn't always look blonde. And I'm wondering if anyone knows if she bleached her hair, lightened her hair, because that would show a, di a difference in just a basic hair comparison, colored sure. hair versus non-colored hair. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's something that's going to be easy to, uh, and again, based upon what I, you know, there's not a whole lot of comparison studies that show, okay, what are the results with hair comparisons compared to mitochondrial DNA? But the one that does exist, you know, that they found that um, if a, a microscopic comparison excluded someone, then that was, that was a pretty good, um, I don't think they found a lot where then they did mitochondrial DNA and it actually included them. Now the other way around that can happen. They include someone as having similar characteristics, but then the mitochondrial DNA excluded them as being the contributor. Mm -hmm. So we have a little bit more faith in the, okay, this is not her DNA or excuse me, not her hair um, versus if they were saying the other way around that it was similar to her. Um so I do think that that's a, a pretty good item of evidence, especially if you have multiple hairs that are in her hand. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. So if they did exhume her body at this point, what would be the level of degradation of the DNA? How easy or difficult is it to pull DNA off a body? Well, we would do old? a bone. We would get a bone. Uh, uh, so from the bone, it shouldn't be too much of an issue to get, to get a profile from the bone sample. Um, it's, but the tissue is going to degrade much more quickly. Right. And, right. Um, and again, I know at some point they had a blood reference sample um, from her. I just don't know what happened to it. And if it was stored in the same place, it doesn't matter. You're not going to get a result or very right. little result. Anyway. They could have a slide at the medical examiner's office, you know, or that they may. those are usually kept separate. And we used to go back and get ones from the sixties and get DNA. Yeah. And, yeah. I agree, except it was never provided as a potential sample. So it makes me... Well, maybe nobody asked for it. Maybe True. nobody went to the medical examiner's office and said, hey, do you guys have slides from the autopsy? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, we have it right over here. You know, because... Right. That, that, most people, some people don't know to ask that, you know. And, mm -hmm. and I, I had this conversation with the medical examiner just the other day about a cold case. Is, you know, we, we probably have the slide here. And, and it's kept in an air-conditioned room. And, and a right. cabinet. no problem at all. Right. 
No, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Morph, how far was Sherry's body from her car? Oh, you're on mute. Morph, that was a mute. detail I tried to find. It couldn't. Less than 100 yards, I believe. We, we I used to have, and I, I couldn't see what Drew put up for pictures, but there was a nice overhead of the parking lot area and the two abandoned homes. Um, yeah. These were like bung, bungalow style homes. Um, and you can almost get a feel for the parking spot to those two homes where she, her body was found in between. Uh, and I'm just off the top of my head, I want to say it's less than 100 yards. It wasn't very far. Um, Be- because five yards. I, I am Company? sort of second guessing myself here. Like, yeah, there is something to it. I don't know that you would go for a long friggin' walk and leave the keys in the car, even if it wasn't working in the doors. Were the doors open? They were unlocked and the windows were down. Okay. I thought, one of, I thought one of the doors was open. Maybe it isn't a photo, I, I, but that I, I just may have been an evidence photo. I don't That's think you. Go, I true. don't think you'd go for a hike and do that, but I do think you would allow yourself to be taken briefly to another part of the parking lot, and then once you're away from your car, you could be enticed a little further away from it. It wasn't yeah. a parking lot, though. This is just a street. Okay, it's from the street, then. I think you would leave your keys in the car for the time it took if you were going to go and actually look at the engine yourself. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you're going to try to start it again in a second. Right. And leave your keys right. there. And then, but if someone's if someone's taking you away from it and they're and they're not and they're not saying to you, "Hey, let's go walk a mile," but they're saying, "Hey, come over here," I think you could very well leave the keys right. in the car, yeah. knowing that my car is right over here behind, behind that building over there. Let's go over exactly. There. Oh, let me just get why it doesn't start, or do you yeah. know what I mean? Especially There's, if it was the old Studebaker that was parked behind. Yeah. So I, I'm I'm halfway with you there. It's like you're right. Someone wouldn't go for a long walk and do that, but they would let themselves be um, digress a little. And Drew, I don't think we heard you. Uh, how far was the car from the body? Uh, 75 feet. 75 feet. feet. 75 Not even yards. yards. Okay. Yards or feet? That's a big difference. Yards or feet? Huge Sorry, difference. Well, it, it's, uh, it's on the internet. It's in the reports. Now, now Drew's got to do his conversion from Canadian to American. Meter does it. <laughs> uh, I, I want to back it's not far at all. 75 yards is how many uh, fathoms, yeah. Stout Yeoman? <laughs> I wanted to backtrack and ask Susanna something before I forget because I don't want to mm-hmm. forget this. I know Riverside has pretty much discounted the the zodiac angle as being involved and discounted the confession letter as being from her killer. They didn't always think that they thought it was from her killer. Have they? said anything to you at any point about examining the letter, the envelope itself, um, the confession letter, envelope, or letter? Not that you'll get anything necessarily, but Mm -hmm. I I, I don't want them to just discount that altogether. Right, right. They should be looking at that as well. Yeah, no, they, they haven't said anything. I don't know what's been done with that. I don't know if they've done any latent print testing or anything like that. Um, and again, I don't know where it's been stored. If it's been stored somewhere um, that's temperature controlled, then yeah, that, that could be a good source of DNA for sure. Especially the, the flap, if they lick the flap. Yep. I mean, that's, that's I mean frankly, thinking. anything at this point, you know, I mean, I can get, I can get results from a typewritten letter from somebody folding it up you know so right. it, it's, 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 yeah. it's worth a shot because you know you know this person took the time so that their typewriter wouldn't be identified you think mm-hmm. they would have taken the time to make sure they wouldn't leave prints on it but the one thing they couldn't know about is dna so right you have to assume that if they lick that envelope mm-hmm. that would be a, ch- a chance to at least look to see if there's anything there that's that's usable I yeah, the remember. envelope or the stamp. Mm-hmm. Were you able, back in the good old days, able to get blood typing from saliva? Uh, it Well, I, as old as I am, I still didn't do that. So, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> secreter status. Yeah, yeah so, secreter status. That's the old mm, school. Yeah. yeah. So if someone, so not everybody secreted those, I guess, enzymes or whatever they were yeah, in, right. into yeah. body fluids, but 
The Both majority of people did, yeah. yeah. And so then you you could at that point, yes. I just want to interject. Angelo was, was one of the non-screeters. Mm. Yeah. There, uh, okay. there was no stamps on the confession letter. There okay. were on the notes that came seven months later. How did the confession letter, was it like dropped off then? Yes. Or, uh, okay. Was hmm. the envelope lit and sealed though? Dropped off where? I assume so. Yeah, so it's probably there. I, it, I would hope they have it in evidence someplace. Where was the, the um, I don't really the, understand the envelope that the letter came in. The confession letter was mailed to the press enterprise, right? And to the police yeah. station. Were, were there two copies of it? So Yes, carbon carbon copies. And uh, yeah. I believe I read that it was it was dropped in a city mailbox. With a rural zip code, or was that the, the second set of letters, the fake ones? I get them confused because Avery got yeah. them confused and he yeah. misprinted okay. it. So I'm trying to remember the opposite of what he said, and I <laughs> shouldn't speculate. Yeah. And now I'm yeah. confused because my research says that the confession letter was po postmark from Riverside, but there were no stamps on it? On the I, thought it was, I thought it was postmarked, but I could be wrong. And I, I don't know if we have a picture right handy that we can yeah, throw. Yeah, because my source on that was you. Okay. <laughs> well, don't trust know. your sources. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca <laughs> asked, why would she voluntarily go into a dark alley with anyone? Did people routinely park there? Well, the reason I brought this up is um, I think the problem is we, we see words and we get an impression in our head, right? So with dark alley, you, you know, what I then see is like just a, like a sea of shadow. Thank you. And, and and dark is a very relative term. So we so, have a. So is it an alley without light? Is it an alley yeah. with less light than some other spot? Like what is? Do you see there what I mean? No what is a dark alley? Time. You well, can see her body in the background, right there on the ground, under the word "same." Yeah. That's her body right there. So that's where it happened. And you can't really see any street lights here. I don't know if there are any. I don't even know if there was electric going to these houses or not. So I don't there's know if there's no any light kind of light. It doesn't go through. It doesn't look like it. Yeah. It yeah, does think there's a through. Right. It does. Yes. Well, and it so at a, night. A turn then, right? At night, yeah. it's dark. And those two buildings, those two houses are going to cast shadows in that pathway, that alleyway between the two. Yeah. It, so who says not... she went into that alley though? So what if she's just walking down the street between these two houses and then he pulls her into the alley? You know, I mean, I don't know. Like I can't, I'm just seeing this picture. So I don't know. I, I would agree though, that most people probably wouldn't venture into again, what you would consider a dark alley. But I think to Lee's point, I mean, that doesn't really look like an alley to me, it looks like, okay, if you're walking past, oh, come up here, my car is here. And then you get pulled into this little alcove or whatever that is dark and no, Would you go, well, hold, hold, no, hold on. I'm not comfortable. Let, oh, me go, yeah. let me go around, right? This guy's here to help you out. And you're like, I don't want to pass through this brief period of darkness because I think you're a psycho. I just, I don't know. I, I don't I think know. people Women, have. Women, I don't know, would have questioned back then. Especially a young girl. Women, there's women that wouldn't question today. This whole idea no, that we true. just learn better. Like people are sabotaged by their own politeness, by their mm -hmm. own desire for expediency. Right. right? Especially there's... back then, you know. Yeah, especially. Yeah. She's, but I... she's in need of help. And here's someone offering help. She's probably mm -hmm, thinking mm -hmm. the best of them. Right. I'm thinking, and I've been thinking that um, the killer knew those two buildings, those two houses were vacant. Oh, that there sure. wouldn't oh, be anybody coming out of them. Oh, yes. interesting. Okay. Well, this yeah. is Nobody would hear. This yeah. is an interesting one that Kathy Arnott put up. Or he said he lived in an apartment right. and was going to let her use the phone. This right. is my house right here. You can use the phone if you want. Mm -hmm. Sure. But then yeah, she yeah, might that's... have known they were abandoned too. They were used for storage. So that's what their school property, those hmm. two houses. And they oh, were okay. used for storage. Any chance um, that desk was in the storage in one of those houses? No, that that was Damn. in the that was in the in the college building, and it was interestingly enough actually in the music room, if I remember correctly. Was that right, Drew? That's correct. The music room and the library were adjoined, if I'm not mistaken, and the desk with the poem on it was actually turned upside down on a desk. You know, they used to stack 
the desk on top of each other when they weren't in use. Mm -hmm. It was upside down and it was written on the underside of the desk like somebody was in there doodling or something. Um, But yeah, any number of reasons to, to that she could have gone down there. I don't think she would have gone down there by herself because, again, trying to put myself in her position, I'm going back into the library. If my choices are walk down that dark alley by myself or walk into that library and try and get help, I'm going to the library. So I think someone had to be there to, to guide her, her in, that, in that direction. To go down yeah. that alley, exactly. Yeah, for Unless sure. They... I, I, and everyone's like on high alert because we're talking about a murder case. Like, well, you know, if I was about to get murdered, I wouldn't do that. It's like, ah, it's it's a balmy <laughs> no, fucking California right. day. You know, you live in, in chill world where nothing goes wrong and you're ag- agreeable. Women tend to be more agreeable than men. Um, and, and you don't want to be rude to someone that's trying to help you out. Right. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, OK, yeah, I'll go through. And then, you know, mm-hmm. the, now we didn't get to why her purse is underneath her. I just figured she fell on it. Yeah, I wish I would have known that detail. Well, we know we know that when she left her automobile, she took it with her, but she didn't take her school books. Mm-hmm. Um, presumably, she hadn't. Uh, geez, Why? I don't know. Because you're she the, wouldn't have taken the books. You take your yeah, purse with you. You, you, that... you have to lug these big heavy things. Yeah. Why you're coming you're back for your to... car? That's there. Your purse yeah, has got. They're your already book. in. Yeah. Because you have to complete an assignment by by tomorrow morning. But she's but Drew, remember she's not going on a hike. She's going on a little side side thing. Oh, yeah. and that's why right. she goes there. She's and I think the project, there. the school project, probably took a back seat once she realized her car was broken down. That's her main priority is getting getting her car fixed or getting mm-hmm. word to her dad that her car is broke down. Whatever. I think right. the, the project probably took a, a back seat. Yep. Yeah, I think almost certainly wasn't she kicked in the head too. Call it. According to the confession letter author, uh, she was. Okay. But she and wasn't? Some, well, some have argued well, that the autopsy uh, shows that she very well could have been. Wasn't well, there particular on her forehead? Come again? Wasn't there particular on her forehead? Yes. Yeah. I saw that in the autopsy report. Yeah. But that wouldn't have been from kicking. That would have been from probably strangling. But that may be where think... people extrapolate and say, oh, she must have been kicked in the head. Yeah, yeah. you got that from pressure. She was kicked after she was dead, it wouldn't have left much of a mark. It would be no that, that's great. And that detail wasn't in the newspaper. You know, they disabled, Correct. they talked about her cart being disabled and all that stuff, but they didn't mention what was done to her as far as kicking. Well, so if the confession letter writer knew that and was correct about it. It was either a lucky guess or he actually did it. How do you get petechia on your forehead? Well, it's from Mild pressure. abrasion from... Yeah. Well, petechia... Rolling around on the ground. Different things. Yeah, petechia is the bursting of small blood vessels and not That's scraping right. on the surface. So if you have a pressure, like a like a uh, immense pressure in your face, it can happen. But to only get it on your forehead and not other places? No, it'd be other places there, too. Probably. There were other places uh, where they okay. showed abrasions <laughs> and stuff. Okay. But is it, I mean, is it possible that it was misdescribed you know, as petechia mm-hmm. when it was actually kind of like, she was more face down, correct? So maybe it's mm-hmm. like a, mm-hmm. like drag, mar- you know, or her, I don't know if there was gravel there. I don't know, you know, or if there was something else that could have potentially caused those marks. But yeah, could I mean, it have been liver? Yeah. One would hope that the medical examiner mm-hmm. would be able to tell, but you never know back then. Yeah. Yeah. What what expertise right. they had. Yeah. 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 The the language part of it is is such a big deal. You know, um, Alex and I have got one case we're just paying over. They said that the woman's breast was macerated, which means to like put in water and sugar like a strawberry. <laughs> And like, did you just mean like lacerated? But this yeah, sounds a little a worse. Typo. It was probably macerated has been used for decades to describe a mutilation, <laughs> something where it's completely, you know, hamburger. Yeah. But yes, it's it's that's yeah. It, it what's well, all the whatever the the language of the time is right, and they, they used that we not use it. And for literary flair, macerated right. sounds much better. Right. It sounds yeah. you know. Unless you know what it means. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So we we didn't really discuss the zodiac aspect much, but you know, maybe now's the good time. 
So I don't know. What are your intuitions? Uh, you think Zodiac did this? No. I don't. If you take that. the letters out, you wouldn't think that, would you? Right. I, so, for a long time, I thought for sure that he wrote the letters in the case and, you know, didn't really kill her, but had written the letter, mm-hmm. especially since the handwriting expert confirmed that it was his writing. But then it all comes back to that article uh, in 1969, the the pictures of the Sherry Joe Bates letters, the exact spelling, the writing, the words was all printed in that article, you know, and I used to think that that had to be Zodiac spelling the word wrong the same way, using the same phrase. Then I realized that he could have easily gotten it out of that magazine article. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and word for word, misspelling for misspelling. Mm-hmm. So I sort of, you know, sort of you know fell off the fence and said you know i don't think this is zodiac down there most likely the other connection is the car tampering which is in the kathleen john's case but that's right. only um that's not proven zodiac either no, that's another that's, zodiac right. adjacent case yeah and and the tire thing i'm telling you I, I found two dozen articles all over california of people doing the same exact thing with tires uh attacking women at night it was just a real mm-hmm. common ploy to to attack women what about the um, Oceanside Ray Davis, the taxi driver case? That's even earlier. Any thoughts of that being? Because some people think that that's connected. I think that I, I'm not. I'm not necessarily thinking so because I feel like why would he start with the taxi driver and then end with the taxi driver? You know. But there were a lot. Uh, do you know? Are you familiar with that case? Yeah. More. And I hope we get to take that one on because the similarities, mm-hmm. even at first blush, are like. Wow, this is this is Paul Stein. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So and that's like why people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's one I've also worked on. So I'm okay. Well, what is so. a, what? What are the similarities? Um, the similarities are that um, taxi driver was okay. So he's he's shot in the back, pulled out of his cab. Cab is driven somewhere else. The cab but wasn't then, driven somewhere else in Paul Stein. Okay. Okay. Well, then just, that's not just, right. But uh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. But the other thing, the the thing that makes it makes some people think that potential zodiac is the communications with the police. So no, there was there a communication was that. that mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it was, and I haven't looked at this for a little while, but there was communication with the police saying, uh, you know, I, I think it was. Alex, maybe you're you're up on it more, but I, I don't know if it was before no. the taxi driver, but okay. So there was a communication with the police saying, you know what I, you know, I did this to the, you know what I did with the taxi driver, you know, that, that, I don't know if it was a specific about taxi driver, but saying to the Oceanside police, uh, this past murder, well, wait, why don't, watch what I'm going to do next with the buses. And so there was a threat then with buses, which again, that I think ties in with Zodiac as well. So in fact, the people, you know, Oceanside was so concerned that they had military police officers uh, or military, you know, from Pendleton riding on every city bus for a number of weeks, trying to make sure that there wasn't another incident. What year was this? I think it was 64, 64, 65. That would change everything. That would change everything. It was 1962. So it was it 62? Okay. Yeah, April okay. of 62. That would change okay. the call. Everything. The call came two days before the attack. Okay, thank you. So and you're I haven't read it for a while, so I forgot, but okay. The caller said, I'm going to pull off something baffling here in Oceanside, you and you guys will never figure it out. Something okay. to that effect. And then two days after the body was discovered, he called back and and uh, you know, announced his presence and said he's going to get him a bus driver next. Okay. And one of the connections that we haven't spoken of tonight, um, because again, it's something we can't confirm, is uh, in the confession letter for Riverside, uh, he ends the, the call by saying that, uh, or he ends the letter by saying, I was the one who called you, that was just a warning. I'm stalking your girls now. That's right. Hmm. Hmm. And this supposedly is what was said in that correspondence in the Oceanside too? Uh, I'm sorry, give that to me again. So, is it, Are you saying that the, the same way he signed off in Oceanside with a similar sign-off phrase? No, just that there was a call in, in both uh, the Riverside 
and Oceanside and obviously Zodiac. Well, it's, it's terroristic activity without a political motive, right? It, I mean, that's what unites yeah. it all. That's what's interesting is, mm-hmm. is it's like, um, I'm going to terrorize you for the sake of me. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really by itself. Yeah, he's like the Riddler. But then again, yeah. if you want to get a, a, a easy victim, someone that's easily accessible and, and you can get away relatively scot free, what do you target? Cab drivers, yeah. sex workers. Um, mm-hmm. Those are the people that usually are targeted because you can you can get away with it. Yeah, a big difference is uh, is obviously that uh, in Oceanside he dumps the body somewhere, relocates the cab. At the uh, mayor's front yard, wasn't it? Did he drop it in the mayor's front yard? Or something yeah, that's like that? another thing. It would uh, on the on the surface of it, there may have been uh, a political angle involved. Ooh, we got to do this one. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How yeah. can people not like the Zodiac? Look at these fucking people go, are you covering Zodiac? It's so boring. It's like boring. What are you talking about? It's the single most interesting homicidal artist of the 20th century. <laughs> homicidal artist. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Especially yeah. without artist. sexual sadism or any type of paraphilias that make it really weird and fucked up. No. <laughs> exactly. All right, on that note, I got to run, y'all. If we talk Thank about so uh, the other case, we'd love to talk about that one. I've tried to get the detectives to um, agree to come on and talk, but they they can't. Oh, yeah. They're they like, still no. Won't. They're, they're yeah. very tight-lipped about it. 60-something years old. The, the, the yeah. players are all dead. The suspects are dead. What do they have to lose at this point? Yeah, I don't like know. Ken, there's something. Like Ken there's Maine something, say, though. Ken Maines would say, how's that working out for you? Right. <laughs> so that's what so you said on, on the Zodiac. <laughs> yeah. right. Have a good night, Susanna. <laughs> good night, Susanna. Thank you. All right. Night. Bye. Have a good night. Okay. Good night. Bye. Well, I mean, it's a question of the motive, right? Is how's it working out for you if your main motive is to solve the case? Right. But that's well, probably not their main motive. If, if that's not it, then somebody. Now, this is what I always wanted to ask. So I'm going to ask you, Cloyd. Let's say you've got a case where the crime happens. What is 1962? I, can, I, can, I have a hard time doing math when, it old, when it's older than me. 61 years so, ago. So let's just say hypothetically the suspect was 20 years old at the time. Right. He'd be 80. He'd be at 80. At what point do you say, okay, the suspect's dead? What point do you decide you'll talk about a case well, it's, openly that is that old? Why would you not? If, if I guarantee no it, it's not, it's not the detectives working on the case, it's the bureaucracy above them. Because they have no common sense, and it's all about policy and shit like that. And they, I just, I never understood that yeah. when a case is so point, yeah. old that at you cannot point, charge anybody. Yeah, yeah it exactly. It's something you gotta go. Well, you know, we got nothing else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we're getting to that point with the Zodiac case. At some point, he's probably dead it, too. It's gonna be. I, I agree with that. Um, that he, that he is dead. But at some point, you've got to say, okay. This is like the biggest case in American history. W- what's it going to hurt to put this material out there and say, okay, here's what we really know. Here's everything that he sent, blah, blah, blah. Things they've been holding back when, when it's impossible for him to pay for his oh, crime. In that case, you, have, you have more than one jurisdiction that's in charge of it too. And so, you know, that yeah. causes other problems. And it's, it's a bureaucratic thought process. Yeah, and it's just so aggravating when they when they don't release something on a case that old where there's no possible way that the person that can be charged. Right. So I have a question. Do any of you know if any of the suspects in Zodiac have ever been connected to Riverside? Nope. Russell. Um no, but he, right. but there's no reason that he should be a suspect in the other Zodiac murders. He's not connected to the Bay Area. Well, the, you know, yeah and no. We, you know, I learned a great deal about him from somebody that knew his brother, and his brother suspected he was Zodiac for reasons I don't know. His brother's dead, so I can't ask him. Um, he he's a he was a dead ringer for the Zodiac sketch. He's the closest yeah. I've ever seen to anyone that looks like the Zodiac sketch. Except the issue was, the Zodiac. issue was he was six foot two and he's taller than just about every account of him. And we can never place Ross Sullivan in Vallejo in the closest we could get with Santa right. Cruz. And he was he was 
from what we can tell, he was um, pretty schizophrenic and having, you know, I don't know that he'd be capable of stringing together enough competent, coherent thoughts, things to do. When you what say Zodiac schizophrenic, did. do you mean like, actually diagnosed as yeah, schizophrenic he was, or? He was paranoid schizophrenic, yeah. Okay. Um, Zodiac and, could have been like a little schizophrenic. This, I, I, I get the feeling that he was, or... he, I, he was institutionalized at least a, a couple times. Um, and I just don't. Full know, blown. By I, what I age just, was he institutionalized? He had, by the time he was in Riverside, he had already spent time. Okay. When they suspected him in the Sherry okay. Joe Bates case. Yeah, probably. He had already spent time in institutions. Um, I, I just, like Is... I said, his connection to Riverside. And is a similarity to the Zodiac sketch were the most two powerful things because he's the he's the only suspect out of anybody that you can name that can be placed one hundred percent on that campus right. property. Um, but, and but, he just but, so but, happened to look like the sketch. But besides that, there's just not much there. Your guy, Mac Attack, can be placed in Vallejo, right next to the phone booth where Zodiac right. called. Well, yeah, that's and true. He also looks like the sketch. Yeah, general description wise, he's you know he doesn't look as much of the sketch like Ross looked like the sketch, but you know there the couple things that like Mike Majo said something very specific. He said he had a very round face. And this guy Mac has a very round face. That was just a unique thing that Majo said, and this guy just happens to match that. So I mean, the one of the thing about people who look like the Zodiac back in the '60s, you take virtually any guy that wore glasses. Oh, yeah. And they all, if looked, you weren't a they hippie, all had horn rim glasses. Yeah, you, you had know. horn rim glasses and a crew cut, or you were a hippie. It was like Drew looks tight. like the Zodiac <laughs> right now. That's what I've been told. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wait a second. <laughs> Maybe he is. <laughs> Very he well preserved for your age, my dear. Thank you. So okay. back to the schizophrenic thing. I know that back in olden times. Uh, the word schizophrenic was used as kind of a catch-all for any type of mental illness or disorder. Could that have been the case with Sullivan? He now he was he was paranoid schizophrenic was his diagnosis, and that's what he was institutionalized. And um, he did. I'll give you an example. In 1968, he got naked and jammed the guy into a phone booth and tried to climb in with them and the police had to come it comes to <laughs> save the guy out of the phone booth that's um, right he went into um somebody's apartment uh and did something with mayonnaise i don't remember exactly what it was <laughs> i think he took out a jar of mayonnaise out of their fridge and started smearing it all over the walls or something i, I don't remember exactly what that's it was not abnormal not uh, that um, not just that. weird uh, it just and and again the the key thing was though I could never place this guy in Vallejo um, mm -hmm. or San Francisco, even though the informant that knew him said he had ties to San Francisco. The closest I got him was Santa Cruz, which is what, 100 miles away or something from Vallejo. Um, so I, I could just never, you know, I could never place him in Vallejo. So in my mind, I could never call him Zodiac because he, it was just too far away. You know, whoever Zodiac was, was in and around Vallejo. And that, that wasn't Ross. Have there been developments on Mac since we spoke? No, no. no. Stop. They, well, they they they've got all the information they need, <clears throat> and I think what they're doing. See, the problem is a million people send them. Okay, I know who the Zodiac was. It's this yeah, guy, no. and they've been on that road a million times. Um, and I think what they want to do, and maybe it just won't ever happen, is I think they want to do genealogy. And just see where the where it goes, and whoever it goes to, it goes to instead of that's, investigating that's one, a thousand cheating. different people. I don't like um, this DNA. It's like using Game Genie. It's rendering yeah, you all I, obsolete. I, it's, it's the only way the case is going to be solved though, at this point. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, I think um, is genealogy if if it can be Game done. But genealogy. But then there was the whole fiasco a couple of years ago. What has it been two years now? That the um, I still don't understand it, and I don't know that Tom explained it properly oh, no. but uh, essentially the police were working on something with dna and genealogy in the zodiac case and 
it led them to a suspect that could not possibly be Zodiac, whatever that means. Whether that means it was a woman, it was a black person, <laughs> it was a, someone who was too young to be Zodiac. I don't know what that means. That was the only thing. And again, this is secondhand information delivering this. So I don't know if it's not being explained properly. Um, you know, the person I had that knew a lot about the Zodiac case and the evidence retired. Um, so I sort of lost my good in with, with what was going on with it. So a lot of this stuff is secondhand information. I just don't know that it's being explained right. But they thought it was their best chance at finding him was using this. And it, it led to someone that they say could not be Zodiac. Well, you know, if you're talking genealogy, you could get it because it, it doesn't lead you to a specific person. It leads you to a, several people. And mm -hmm. if they're using the YSTR, it could be someone on that male side. And they just picked the wrong guy. It could, it, it, could, I, it could be, and I don't know. Again, yeah. I, I'm, since it's secondhand, and I'm not privy to to that's, what the exact language was, I don't know what. That's the case why you got to go back and do a one on one. Once you get that guy, you have to do a oh, one on yeah. one DNA comparison and confirm yeah. the results. And it oh, yeah. it isn't that m much of a possibility that that they chose the wrong person. And even though it was, you know, it, the male female thing is not going to work because they're either there's yeah. either a YST a Y chromosome or there isn't. You know, then right. yeah. Which you think they would have seen right away when they, they did this DNA yeah, work that they would have done. They would have said, okay, this is female DNA. We got a problem right now. Yeah. Unless you're going to buy into the thing that he had his daughter lick the stamps or something or lick, lick the envelopes sealed well, or something like that. that. I mean, DNA had his dog lick the, the envelopes. So, I mean, if. <clears> in, I refresh my memory. Where, from which case do they have DNA for comparison in Zodiac? Well, the, the several of the letters you would think they the letters the okay. envelope flaps and and got it off there. They had oh, maybe touch DNA answer. from there. Yeah. They they tried to do touch DNA on the ropes that he handled at Lake Berryessa, mm -hmm. um, that came back negative. But last I heard, last time they did anything with that was years ago. So I don't know if yeah, they could they do something different. Back. They should impact. I think so They're too. probably trying to swab it. I have I many so profiles too. on there, though. I mean, so all they, the yeah, it, it, then they have many profiles, and you you figure out you go one at a time and go through the list right. of them and, well, and figure this? out which. Are one there any the samples person. from the victims? No. He didn't really touch no, the well, victims. Right, that's the thing. No, he means yeah. that. He well, he did. Now, Mariessa. There could be casings, yeah, casings and stuff. Yeah. There could be. Um, because I, I'm sure they've got plenty of casings and, and whatnot. But the, the I think I think the the strongest possibility are the the envelopes. But again, depending on how they were stored and and kept, you know. Well, and again, the, the my understanding is that they found DNA and it led to someone that could not be Zodiac, whatever that means. I don't know what that means. Yeah. But if if Zodiac licked a, a a sealed envelope and then you found the dna off that and it went to someone that couldn't be zodiac i don't understand that unless well, again what if having what if the letters to, were hoaxes there are people that say the letters are not what could they 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 info that not all back in killer would have no but then but then again then that would seem to indicate that all the letters would be hoaxes then because there were so many of them and and you can well, they should compare some of them the are so obvious to each other and see if they're yes. the same profile Right. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know, again, I don't know what they're doing behind the scenes. I, I really think this is on a shelf. Like, I think most of these cops that are working this case are like, oh, I can't wait for this case to be off my hands and onto the next guy's hands. Because right. um, I really think it's a distraction for them, especially in Vallejo and San Francisco, because the crime is just out of control. So they're working on solving cases from today and yesterday, not 50, 60 years That's ago. That's why you have to have a dedicated cold case team yeah. or detectives that aren't bothered by the new stuff coming in because you'll never yeah. get anything done. Yeah. Yeah, that's no. the thing. And I, I I, feel, you know, I've talked to some cops that have worked this case that were happy to have it and excited to work it and tried to do their best with it. And I've talked to other cops that were just like, in six months, I get rotated off this case and I can't wait for it. And somebody else is just yeah. going to be a caretaker uh, once right. I'm gone. And, you know, I, I just don't I don't know if, it, if it's not for uh, genealogy solving this at this point. I just don't know how it's going to get solved. You're, I think that's you solved way. it. 
You solved it. I found them, man. <laughs> yeah, but it, but again, even if even if I'm right, unless they have something to link them to it, physical evidence, it doesn't matter. Right. Even if I'm 100 percent right, if they don't have the physical evidence to, to make it confirmed, what good does it do? Um. So it's a maddening case. Yeah, it's 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 very They're frustrating when you you have witness sketches of the guy. You got fingerprints that he left. Um, you've got all these sealed envelopes, all his handwriting. You know, yeah. Zodiac it, wasn't some, careful. The so frustrating. Jerry Joe Bates wasn't, killer wasn't careful. Yeah, it I mean, all that writing. Just think of the millions of people that have seen Zodiac's writing, and that writing's not the skies. That's his real everyday. It doesn't writing. have any friends. <laughs> and well, yeah. somebody somewhere worked with this guy or read that writing before. It's just frustrating that somebody doesn't say, "Oh my God, that so and so's writing." Because well, you, think, you, know, you might have tips in there that say that, you know, and that they couldn't go farther than that. Yeah, it's so funny. I mean, they go all around the houses in some of these cases, and then they get solved, and you're like, "Oh yeah," like there was um, the Christine Jessup case in Canada. It was this really interesting homicide case. One of the best true crime books ever was written on the Christine Jessup case. And they were going off in, everywhere, and this turned out to be someone that worked with her father. That's her, how it usually ends up, you know. Occam's mm-hmm. razor. <laughs> you know? Well, the, and, and Zodiac obviously is different because he's just randomly trolling spaces, looking for people that are in those spaces, not targeting them specifically. So I think that's it. Was always an uphill battle because of the anonymous. But with all of them, with all of them, I mean, that in itself is an assumption, right? There could be one of them that it isn't. Yeah, I mean. It, Technically, but probably the first. Uh, like um, the first. Drew and I know someone that thinks that was Darlene Farron's husband. Mm-hmm. Oh, I I've talked to her husband. He's a he's a son of a bitch. He's a, <laughs> yeah, he was Is he, like a sorcerer or something. Uh, no, he's um. <laughs> I, I talked to him probably about ten years ago and had a good conversation with him. And he, I could tell by the hate in his voice that he had for her after all this time. I, I came off that call saying, I hope they properly ruled this guy out in her, in her death because I could tell by by his voice, in my opinion, that he hated her after all this time. No no empathy, no sympathy for her being killed. He was hateful of her. Um, so if, if somehow it came out that he was responsible in her case, it wouldn't shock me. Drew, do you remember this person? We know what th- what this person's case was for it being... The husband, not that you, you or the, I believe that the the reasons uh, why he's a, a decent suspect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess they're numerous, uh, but there's um, it's a it's a long dis- discussion. I'd say he he fits he somewhat fits the physical profile. They think he's uh, uh, he might have been uh, a couple inches shorter than. Uh, than Zodiac was described to be. Uh, he had special training in the army and uh, guns and cryptography. Um, he was in the media, uh, like he was a newspaper writer. Uh, mm-hmm. He drove a car exactly like what was described at uh, yeah. Blue Rock Springs. Uh, countless things, countless things. The one thing that's a strike against him is he was a hippie during the Zodiac murders. That's not a big strike. That fits Lee's. Uh, not the crew cut. No, not no, the crew no, it cut. doesn't. No, it doesn't. But, <laughs> not but, the crew cut. Didn't you mention something guy. about him dabbling in that for a while? Esoterica and, and that kind of stuff, but no, not hippie. No, I thought he'd be more conservative. Um, but no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't break it. You know what I mean? Based on that. Um, yeah, but at the same time, if he's got long hair and a full beard and mustache, that's not what Zodiac looked like. Right. Yeah. right, and they didn't get him until they didn't arrest him until January of 1970. So uh, you couldn't really go by hair or facial hair, um, and it's hard to even go by lifestyle at that point. Well, they he wasn't he living at a hippie commune. Yeah, in nineteen seventy. I, I, I don't. I, yeah, I, I just don't see a the a guy with a crew cut living in a hippie commune. I don't know. It, no, but there's, there's... again, he he was 
fingerprinted. He was. They did take his writing. They did do mm-hmm. other means of trying to rule him out. So I hope they they properly rule him out. I, I just I just know in talking with him that he sounded like he had hate in his heart for his for the for. But Darlene. that's that's the case, right? And and that's why I think cops get so so jaded is because when you actually go and you start looking for like, well, who's who's the psycho. You start finding that there's they're everywhere, right? Yeah, like that's exactly. was that the thing that you said, Cloyd? Um, you came home to Doreen one time, and you're like, I found one, Doreen. She's like, What? You're like, a family that's not screwing their kids. Yeah. Remember <laughs> that? But like, yeah, I mean, the people are so naive. Like they're <clears throat> when you just pile them all up, there's just yeah, so everywhere. many. There's you, so you many. You're a bastard and an evil because I mean you did this one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, ex- exactly. And then with Zodiac, why it's so intriguing is because you have this interesting supervillain, and then you have all these people that could be him. And there's mm-hmm. really good arguments for it. Like the Arthur Lee Allen thing. Oh my god. It's infuriating. <coughs> yeah, and, and what the- you end up with is uh, a stack on both sides of pros and cons, and you it's hard to weigh them because they're all built on shaky foundations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then you talk about tunnel vision, the uh, Leo PD and a lot of the SFPD all liked Arthur Lee Allen, um, but he doesn't. He doesn't even fit the descriptions. If you're going by the descriptions, what the guy looked like, he wasn't a balding guy. He had hair, you know, whether it was a crew cut or not. But you know, Arthur Lee Allen didn't really look like the thing. But it's hard to discount somebody when a guy comes forward and turns them in and says he said he was going to call himself Zodiac and kill people. That's it's hard to not. <laughs> you know be interested in that guy as a suspect he had well, a, like, he like had a zodiac the... watch yeah, yeah I mean, pick off yeah. the kitties yeah well but, like yeah. in the cherry and how much case, I, either witnesses you know he this person allegedly tells witnesses that he did it mm. and if he that really happened then he probably did it yeah and okay. if uh uh don cheney wasn't lying then arthur lee allen probably did it yeah. Right. Or, so but, then, but then you find out he's got he's got motives. He molested his kid. So then all of a sudden you see a motive there why he would want to turn in um I didn't know he know. molested right. his kid. Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. Allegedly. Uh, let me that, well, let me just put the parenthesis. Yeah. We all that. we're all presuming that Gray Smith was telling the truth about these things that were said about Arthur Lee Allen, too. Well, well some Not of right? it's documented. Some of it's some documented. of it is documented. He was yeah, he and, was a pedophile. But it's, well, but it's also true that a lot of the cops got a lot of their knowledge about the case from Gray Smith, and that didn't do anyone any favors. Well, there's a question for, for Cloyd I'm curious about. How often do you see someone just um, completely fabulating uh, things about a person to make them look guilty? I don't know. Sometimes they do, but really they're, what they're doing is they're, they're adjusting what they know subconsciously trying to make it fit and they're convinced this is the right guy or they'll tweak it a little bit to make it sound more likely just because they're all amateur sleuths and and that kind of shit but you know yeah when you have a big case you get calls with thousands of people saying this guy did it and they're all a thousand different guys right Mm -hmm. so that it's just normal in these situations and so how how much credence can you pay to all of those how you, you can't, for one. What I look for is when the same name comes up from two different sources and they don't know about each other. Then mm-hmm. then you start looking, right? You look for duplication where more, more than one person is saying this guy is the guy. And, and there wasn't really that with with Arthur Lee Allen. It was no. Don, Don Chaney accusing him. And no, there, there was others, but but they yeah. have just as shady Calling reputation. Him. One yeah, guy well, was looking at 30 years in prison oh, yeah, yeah. when he came uh, yeah. out of the woodwork. Uh, I don't know what the deal is with these uh, people who uh, were children at the time, the seawaters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know what their deal is. I don't well, believe them, but I don't really know their motive either. I think Arthur Lee Allen is one of these people that got off on the attention of being a suspect, that enjoyed the cat and mouse with the cops. Like, I didn't do this, so I know they can't arrest me, but I like the attention it's giving me, so I'm going to I'm going to go along with it and make them think it was me. I think he sort of basked in that. It's very weird for a pedophile to get off on police attention, in my mind. 
Yeah. But, but, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't deny it. He brought up details that um, he wasn't asked about. Yeah. Like bloody knives. And I want yeah. to ask him, do you have any, do you have any bloody knives on you at the time of the murder? Well, yeah, mm. but I used those to kill a chicken. <laughs> yeah. After yeah. Yeah, I'm not saying he wasn't screwing around with them. I'm just saying I'm baffled by the motive. Yeah, it's it's a very frustrating case, and I, I think we'll be touching on it as best we can. But it's hard to hard to get this giant case into like a couple episodes and yes. really do a complete thing. So hopefully, people listening will appreciate what we can put in there. Drew and I did um, some episodes on my show called Rabbit Hole, where we just spoke about about these cases that that you fall into, but like a lot of people do, and they just multiply, and, and it's almost like fun to get lost in them. It's almost like addicted, addictive. Like, what if Son of Sam was in the cult? Which I don't believe at all. I, I don't in yeah. any way believe that David Berkowitz was part of a satanic cult. I don't think he had any friends. Right. Right. But his, his it's, neighbor's dog was though. That's the important thing. Well, that's <laughs> but that's the interesting thing though, right? It's like if you go, I don't know though, and you turn down there, it's really fucking yeah, fun. You get it's you get into these rabbit holes, yeah. And they, yeah, I'll, I don't, I'll tell I don't you, like the rabbit holes. I'll, I'll <laughs> tell you what though, you know, not to go too far off in the weeds, but like if you watch that documentary, The Sons of Sam, um, based on Maury Terry's book. There were some wildly different sketches. I know you can say that sketches aren't reliable. There were some wildly different composites of shooters that were purported to be Berkowitz. Like one guy, right. that was one was guy friends. saw a tall, skinny, <laughs> blonde-haired guy um, that, and he was under a, a street light, no less, when he saw him, and he was one hundred percent convinced, and he still is. He said, "There's no way that was David Berkowitz. I saw shoot those people." Um, he was too skinny, he was tall, he was blonde, it just wasn't him. Uh, and the guy's still convinced after all this time that someone else shot, th shot these people. And, and Berkowitz is there, like in prison, he's like, Well, now it's time to tell the real story <laughs> about the organization. Yeah. Everyone's like, Really, David? He's like, Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, why would we disbelieve David Berkowitz? <laughs> <laughs> and he's just sitting there, and he's got that smug little smile on his face. And then, like, and I, I love watching him do like that Scott Bond guy. That Dr. Scott Bond, who's mm, like wrote a yeah. book in his voice, and he's like, he's like, I believe David Berkowitz didn't leave alone, <laughs> um, didn't work alone. And I'm just going like, oh, dude, you have a PhD, and this guy totally played you. <laughs> Coincidentally, <laughs> Lee, remember when we were on an airplane and happened to sit next to one of the detectives on the David, Ber David, David Berkowitz. Berkowitz. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He heard us talking about murder, and he, oh, I'm NYPD. Yeah, I was a, one of the lead detectives in David Berkowitz. Oh, really? <laughs> that was kind of a small role. So, do you have any any cases like that, Cloyd? Because like you're so jaded with this, do you have any that you just you can't leave alone? You can't be like, well, that's the answer. The First evidence. All, you, you presume that I left unsolved cases behind. Well, no, I mean even cases that you didn't work on, but just oh, yeah, sure. read about. Yeah, it. absolutely. There were yeah. the the worst the worst case is uh, the, uh, the the murder of a little six year old girl. That happened in Seattle, and coincidentally, I was 14 at the time and had a police scanner and listened to the call come out and, and hear about it, this missing little girl, and then she's found later murdered, and when I'm in homicide, that case is still there, and the hard part about that case is everybody knows who did it. He was a kid that lived up the street, but somebody released all the evidence, <laughs> and there's no physical mm -hmm. evidence left in the case, because they signed it off as a missing person, and, and everybody knows who did it, and he even told his wife you don't do it, I'll do it. I'll do what I did to uh, what was her name, whatever her name was. I'll do to you what I did to her. But of course, his wife can't testify to that because that's yeah. they're married. So that's wow. all there is. You know, that's uh, that was that's mm. the most frustrating case. His little six year old girl. He was like fifteen or something at the time, and lived three or four houses away. Kidnapped her, raped her, murdered her, dumped her in some blackberry br brushes, and she was Jeez. found a few days later. Yeah. Wow. Oh. Well, M. Shingleton has a comment. Maybe we got on that comment. We'll call it a wrap. Um, she says, uh, she or he, whoever M is, I don't know anything about the Zodiac, so I'll be looking forward to the next show. It's going oh, to be interesting, oh, yeah. and we're going to try and uh, um, 
I like that. I like when people come in with a fresh mind and they're not jaded and they don't yeah. have all kinds of stereotypes and, and directions they've been pushed in by books and stuff like that. So hopefully um, M. Shingleton and everyone else will get something out of it. So I look forward to it. And with that, I've got to call it a night, everyone. So I hope yeah. uh, I really like this conversation. And uh, Cherry's case is definitely interesting. And the Zodiac discussion will be as well. All right. Thanks for having right. me on, guys. Yeah, back behind the camera now, Drew. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll see you next time. All right, guys. Okay. Good night, everyone. Take care. Bye bye.